statutory construction. Attorney Ferdinand G. S. Q. Gilder The most brilliant mind cannot be compared to the palest ink, Chinese proverb. Statutory construction, defined. Art. Legislative intent. In enacting a statute. And applying it to a certain set of facts. Scope of construction. Intention is doubtful. Ambiguity in language. Ambiguity is thus a condition precedent for a statutory construction. Ambiguity, defined. Duplicity of meaning. Remedy of courts in case of ambiguity. Construe statute. Give it meaning. In accord with legislative intent. Purpose of construction. Ascertain. And give effect. Legislative intent. Construction distinguished from interpretation. Interpretation, meaning of words, construction, reads between the lines. Legislative intent, defined. History of enactment. Evil sought to be prevented or cured. Essence of the law. No need to collect the subjective wishes of each member. But the objective footprints left in the trail of legislative enactment. Legislative purpose, defined. Reason why the law was passed. Is it to prevent mischief? Create new rights? Legislative intent, distinguished from legislative purpose. Combined application of purpose and meaning is legislative intent. Example, a statute prohibits operation of a motor vehicle in a public highway while the driver is intoxicated. Does motor vehicle include motorcycle? Does intoxication include influence on narcotics? Legislative meaning, defined. What the law means, by its language. It comprehends, covers or embraces, limits or confines. Illustrative case, Federation of Free Farmers vs. CA, General Register No. 41161 Sept. 10, 1981. Section 1 of Republic Act 809, Sugar Act of 1952 provides. In the absence of written milling agreements between the majority of planters and the millers of sugarcane in any milling district in the Philippines shall be divided between them. Issues. What is the meaning of in the absence of written milling agreements? Does RA 809 apply even if there is a written milling agreement different from the sharing proportion provided by it? Does the phrase any increase in participation granted under this act exclude written agreement? Held. RA 809 applies with or without written milling agreements between the planter and the mill, even if its literal interpretation says otherwise. Legislative intent in enacting Republic Act 809. In the 1950s, planters staged a strike and threatened not to plant sugar cane unless they were given bigger share in the sugar industry and sugar quota commitment. To remedy the problem, Congress enacted RA 809 to force planters to plant, centrals to mill and even allowing the government to take over planting and milling. The evil sought to be avoided by Congress is the exploitation of laborers or sacada in terms of wages and benefits. To make the act operative with or without the written milling agreement. Legislative purpose in enacting Republic Act 809, to compel continuous sugar production and grant laborers share in the increased planters' participation in the sugar produce. Legislative meaning in enacting Republic Act 809. Although not clearly disclosed in the language of the Act, it however indicates that the laborers should receive their share for as long as sugar is produced and planters receive increased participation. Thus, to literally interpret these phrases is to defeat legislative intent and purpose, which is to grant laborers fair share in sugar produce. Legal hermeneutics, defined. Branch of science establishes principle and rules of statutory construction. Exegesis, application. Different kinds of interpretation. Close interpretation. Literal. Extensive interpretation. Liberal. Extravagant interpretation. To pass from the true meaning. Free or unrestricted interpretation.
based on general principles of interpretation in good faith. Limited or restricted interpretation. Influenced by other principles. Predestined interpretation. Biased. Who is authority to construe law? Judiciary. Limitations on power to construe. Judicial legislation when a court, under the guise of interpretation, modifies, amends, remodels or rewrites a statute. Illustrative case. Canet v. Deceny General Register No. 155344, January 20, 2004. Facts. A businessman applied for permit to operate and maintain a cockpit. But the mayor refused because there is no ordinance empowering her to do so. Contention of the businessman, he invokes a resolution authorizing him to operate a cockpit and a municipal tax ordinance providing for issuance of a mayor's permit to operate businesses. Contention of the mayor, the mayor refused. Under the local government code of 1991, the authority to give licenses for the establishment, maintenance and operation of cockpits pertains to the Sang Union. Also, there is no ordinance authorizing her to do so. Issue Can the municipal mayor be compelled to issue business permit in the absence of ordinance empowering her to do so? Held No. While there is a resolution allowing her to operate a cockpit, there is no ordinance giving her similar authority. The Municipal Tax Ordinance contains general provisions for issuance of business permits but it is a short on specifics prescribing reasonable fees for cockpit operation. The ordinance providing these specifics was withdrawn by the Sang Union. Otherwise, to compel the mayor to issue permit not only violates section 447 of the local government code but also encroaches on the mayor's administrative prerogatives. Since cockpit operation was not enumerated in the ordinance, it is excluded. The legislature would not have enumerated those covered if it did not intend to limit. Express mention of one thing, person, act or consequence exclude the others, expressio uniasist exclusion ulterior. What is expressed puts an end to what is implied. Expressium facit ses ertus item. An omission at the time of enactment, whether careless or calculated, cannot be judicially supplied even if wisdom recommends it. If there is a legislative gap caused by omission, the judiciary cannot fill that gap. Otherwise, it results in judicial legislation. Question of legislative wisdom Courts cannot pass upon questions of wisdom, justice or expediency of legislation. For as long as laws do not violate the Constitution, the court are limited to interpret and apply them, whether or not they are wise or salutary. Judicial non-interference on question of legislative wisdom. Courts cannot pass upon questions of wisdom, justice or expediency of legislation. For as long as laws do not violate Constitution, the courts are limited to interpret and apply them, whether or not they are wise and salutary. When to construe law, when does a court construe a law? Existence of case before it. Actual case or controversy. Ambiguity. Requisites for statutory construction. Executive construction of statutes. Persuasive but not binding upon the courts. Construction of a partly void statute. Valid portion may stand and be enforced if. Separable. Independent. Sufficient to make a complete, intelligible and valid statute which carries out the legislative intent. Effects of rules of construction upon courts. Not mandatory. Unless expressly provided by statutes. But judicial decisions interpreting laws form part of our legal system. Unless provided by statutes. Examples. Article 10, Civil Code. In case of doubt in the interpretation or application of laws, it is presumed that the law-making body intended right and justice to prevail. Section 4, Labor Code. All doubts in the implementation and interpretation of the provisions of this code, including its implementing rules and regulations, shall be resolved in favor of labor. Part 2. Subjects of Construction. 
1. Constitution. 2. Statutes. 3. Ordinances. 4. Resolutions. 5. Executive Orders. 6. Department Circulars. Constitution, defined. The fundamental law, written or unwritten, that establishes the character of a government by defining the basic principles to which a society must conform, by describing the organization of the government and regulation, distribution, and limitations on the functions of different government departments, and by prescribing the extent and manner of the exercise of its sovereign powers. A legislative charter by which a government or group derives its authority to act. A constitution is that body of rules and maxims in accordance with which the powers of sovereignty are habitually exercised. Broadly speaking, every state has some kind of a constitution, a leading principle that prevails in the administration of its government until it has become an understood part of its system, to which obedience is expected and habitually yielded. Cooley, 1868. Strong, 1963, summarizes the definition of constitution by saying that a constitution may be said to be a collection of principles according to which the powers of the government, the rights of the governed, and the relations between the two are adjusted. The constitution may be a deliberate creation on paper, it may be found in one document which itself is altered or amended as time and growth demand or it may be a bundle of separate laws given special authority as the laws of the Constitution. Or, again, it may be that the bases of the Constitution are fixed in one or two fundamental laws while the rest of it depends for its authority upon the force of custom. Page 11. Philippine Constitution, Defined. A written instrument by which the fundamental powers of the government are established, limited and defined and by which those powers are distributed among the several departments for their safe and useful exercise and for the benefit of the body politic. Malcolm and Laurel, 1936 as cited by Sayers, 2008. Fundamental Law of the Land. Body of Rules and Maxims. Where powers of sovereignty are habitually exercised. Written Instrument. Fundamental powers of the government are established limited and defined, by which these powers are distributed among several departments, for their safe and useful exercise, for the benefit of the body politic. Nature of Constitution Nature of Constitution can be defined as the relationship of the government and its people. Each state have their own version of their preamble and articles which makes their constitutions unique. It is not acceptable for a state to exist without a constitution defining the relationship of the people governing the state and the people who completes the state, recognizes and declares inherent rights and prerogative of a free people. Constitution distinguished from statute. De Leon and De Leon. 1. A constitution is a legislation direct from the people, while a statute is a legislation from the people's representatives. Two. A constitution merely states the general framework of the law and the government, while a statute provides the details of the subject of which it treats. Constitution, general principles and foundation of government, relatively permanent in character. Statute, more detailed, tentative. Common parts of constitution. Constitution of liberty, bill of rights. Constitution of government, framework of government. Constitution of Sovereignty, Procedure for Amending the Constitution 1. Constitution of Government, its provisions should set the framework of government and its powers, and define the electorate. De Leon and De Leon. 2. Constitution of Liberty, its provisions should set forth the fundamental rights of the people and impose certain limitations over the powers of the government as a means of securing the enjoyment of these rights. De Leon and De Leon. 3. Constitution of Sovereignty. Its provisions should point out the mode or procedure for amending or revising the Constitution. Ghana as cited by De Leon and De Leon. Kinds of Constitution. Written and unwritten. As to their form. 1. Written, one which has been given definite written form at a particular time, usually a constituted authority called a constitutional convention. 
De Leon and De Leon. A written constitution is a codified single document. It is an enacted constitution. 2. Unwritten, a product of political evolution, consisting largely of a mass of customs, usages and rejudicial decisions together with a smaller body of statutory enactments of a fundamental character, usually bearing different dates, Ghana, ND is cited by de Leon and de Leon. To this effect, the British constitution is said to be unwritten because it is an uncodified constitution in the sense that there is no single document that can be classed as Britain's constitution. The British constitution can be found in a variety of documents. Truman, 2012. Note, Strong, 1963 argues that classifying constitutions as written and unwritten is a false distinction. This is so because there is no constitution which is entirely unwritten and no constitution entirely written. Cumulative and conventional. As to their origin and history. a. Conventional or enacted, enacted by a constituent assembly or granted by a monarch to his subjects like the Constitution of Japan in 1889, de Leon and de Leon. By being enacted, this means that a constitution is the result of a legal action of a body of persons whose task is to make laws. As for the Japanese constitution of 1889, this law is largely the handiwork of the general, elder statesman, Ito Hirobumi, who, called for a bicameral parliament, the Diet, with an elected lower house and a prime minister and cabinet appointed by the emperor. Meiji, 2012, paragraph 1 b. Cumulative or evolved, is a product of growth or a long period of development originating in customs, traditions, judicial decisions, etc. rather from a deliberate and formal enactment. An example of this is the English Constitution. De Leon and De Leon. Rigid and flexible. As to manner of amending them. 1. Rigid or inelastic one of special sanctity which cannot be amended except by some special machinery more cumbrous than the ordinary legislative process, strong, and he is cited by de Leon and de Leon. In short, strong, 1963, says, the constitution which cannot be bent without being broken is a rigid constitution. 2. Flexible or elastic one which possesses no higher legal authority than ordinary laws and which may be altered in the same way as other laws, Ghana, ND is cited by de Leon and de Leon. In other words, as Strong, 1963, puts it, the constitution that can be altered or amended without special machinery is a flexible constitution. Statute, defined. Statute is an act of legislature as an organized body expressed in the form passed according to the procedure, required to constitute it as part of the law of the land. A statute is a written law passed by a legislature on the state or federal level. It may forbid a certain act, direct a certain act, make a declaration or set forth a governmental action to aid society. A statute begins as a bill and after it is passed by both houses and by the executive officer, the bill becomes a law. Written will of the legislature a public will and people's mandate expressed through their representatives. Other laws outside of the legislature but considered of the same category and binding force as statutes. Presidential decrees issued during martial law, executive orders issued under the Freedom Constitution. Statutes, distinguished from statute law. Statute law is a term often used interchangeably with the word statute. Statute law, however, is broader in meaning since it includes not only statute but also the judicial interpretation and application of the enactment of such statute. Article 8, Civil Code. Judicial decisions applying or interpreting the laws or the constitution shall form a part of the legal system of the Philippines. Doctrine of Stare Decisis. It is the doctrine that, when court has once laid down a principle, and apply it to all future cases, where facts are substantially the same, regardless of whether the parties and properties are the same. Stare decisis. Follow past precedents and do not disturb what has been settled. Matters already decided on the merits cannot be relitigated again and again. 
stare decisive set non quiet to move ear, follow past precedents and do not disturb what has been settled. Statutes, classified. Types of statutes. A. Passed by the Philippine Legislature. 1. Philippine Commission. 2. Philippine Legislature. 3. Batasang Pambanza. 4. Congress of the Philippines. B. Made by the President. 1. Presidential Decrees, 1973 Constitution. 2. Executive Orders, Freedom Constitution. Public or Private. Public Statute, which affects the public at large or the whole community. Private Statute applies only to a specific person or subject. Public Statute, Classified. General, Special and Local Laws. General Law. Applies to the whole state and operates throughout the state alike upon all the people or all of a class. Special law, relates to a particular person or things of a class or to a particular community, individual or thing. Local law, whose operation is confined to a specific locality. Legislative power, defined. It is the power to make, alter, and repeal laws. Scope of legislative power. One. Under the 1973 and Freedom Constitution, the President exercised legislative power which remained valid until repealed. 2. LGU can enact ordinances within their jurisdiction, but such laws are inferior and subordinate to the laws of the state. Primtius v. Erdenita. 3. Administrative or executive officer can make rules and regulations to implement specific laws. Essential feature of the legislative function is the determination of the legislative policy and its formulation and promulgation as a defined and binding rule of conduct. Embraces all subjects, extends to matters of general concern or common interest, unless limited by the Constitution. Constitutional Basis for Legislative Power of Congress Section 1, Article V of the 1987 Constitution Section 1 the legislative power shall be vested in the Congress of the Philippines which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives, except to the extent reserved to the people by the provision on initiative and referendum. Bill, defined. A bill is a proposed legislative measure introduced by a member of Congress for enactment into law, signed by the author, S, filed with the House Secretary. Bill is the draft of a proposed law from the time of its introduction in a legislative body through all the various stages in both houses. It is enacted into law by a vote of the legislative body. An act is the appropriate term for it after it has been acted on and passed by the legislature. It then becomes a statute, the written will of the legislature solemnly expressed according to the form necessary to constitute it as the law of the state. Origin of Bill a bill may originate in the lower or upper house except appropriation, revenue or tariff bills, bills authorizing increase of public debt, bills of local application, private bills, which shall originate exclusively in the House of Representatives. Tolentino v. Secretary of Finance, 235 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 630, 1994 facts, several bills were introduced in the House of Representatives to expand the tax base of the value-added tax system and enhance its administration by amending the National Internal Revenue Code. These were referred to the House and Ways Committee which consolidated a bill and recommended its approval. After approval, it went to the Senate and referred to its Committee on Ways and Means. Thus, petitioners argue that it did not originate exclusively in the lower house because it merely consolidated two distinct bills from the lower and upper houses. This violates the clear mandate of originate which was even qualified by the word exclusively. Held, it is not the law, but the revenue bill, which is required by the constitution to originate exclusively in the House of Representatives. A bill originating in the lower house may undergo extensive changes in the Senate that may result in the rewriting of the entire bill. To insist the revenue statute must be substantially the same as the House bill would be to deny the Senate's power not only to concur with amendments but also to propose amendments. 
for indeed, what the Constitution simply means is that the initiative for filing revenue bill must come from the House of Representatives. This is based on the theory that since they are elected by their districts, they are expected to be more sensitive to the local needs and problems. Thus, while it is true that a revenue bill must originate exclusively in the House of Representatives, the Senate can propose amendments that rewrites the entire bill or substitute it with an entirely separate and distinct bill. How a bill becomes a law. How does a bill becomes a law, steps. A bill before it becomes a law must pass the strict constitutional requirements explicit both in the 1973 Constitution and the 1987 Constitution. Passage of a bill in a parliamentary system, unicameral assembly. A. A member of the National Assembly may introduce the proposed bill to the Secretary of the National Assembly who will calendar the same for the first reading. Filing with the House Secretary. Secretary reports the bill for the first reading. b. In the first reading, the bill is read by its number and title only. c. After the first reading, the bill is referred by the Speaker to the appropriate committee for study. At this stage, the appropriate committee will conduct public hearings. Then after the public hearings, the committee shall decide whether or not to report the bill favorably or whether a substitute bill should be considered. Should there be an unfavorable report of the committee, then the proposed bill is dead. d. Upon favorable action by the committee, the bill is returned to the National Assembly and shall be calendared for the second reading. Composition Experts in the subjects under their jurisdiction. What happens in the committee stage? Dash it may hold public hearings on the proposed measure. Bill comes under sharpest scrutiny. Committee may approve or reject the bill with or without amendments, rewrite the bill entirely, report it favorably or without recommendation. Committee reports and recommends for calendar for second reading. e. In the second reading, the bill is read in its entirety. In full with the amendments proposed by the committee, if any. Unless copies were distributed before and such reading is dispensed with. The bill will be subjected to debates, motions and amendments. After the amendments have been acted upon, the bill will be voted on second reading. f. Immediately after the second reading, the bill is set for open debates where members of the assembly may propose amendments and insertions to the proposed bill. g. After the approval of the bill in its second reading and at least three, three calendar days before its final passage, the bill is printed in its final form and copies thereof distributed to each of the members. H. The bill is then calendared for the third and final reading. At this stage, no amendment shall be allowed. Only the title of the bill is read and the National Assembly will then vote on the bill. Under the present 1987 Constitution, after the third and final reading at one house where the bill originated, it will go to the other house where it will undergo the same process. Final vote for yeas and nays shall be taken and entered in the journal. I. After the bill has been passed, it will be submitted to the Prime Minister, President, for approval. If he disapproves, he shall veto it and return the same with his objections to the National Assembly, House where it originated, and if approved by two-thirds of all its members, shall become a law. Under the present setup, if the originating House will agree to pass the bill, it shall be sent, together with the objections to the other house by which it shall be likewise be considered and must be approved by two-thirds of the votes. Every bill passed by Congress shall be acted upon by the President within thirty, thirty, days from receipt thereof. Otherwise, it shall become a law. Section 26, 2, Article V, 1987 Constitution. Tolentino v. Secretary of Finance. 235 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 630, 1994. No bill passed by either House shall become a law unless it has passed three readings on separate days, and printed copies thereof in its final form have been distributed to its members three days before its passage, except when the President certifies to the necessity of its immediate enactment to meet a public calamity or emergency. Upon the last reading of a bill, no amendment thereto shall be allowed, and the vote thereon shall be taken immediately thereafter, 
and the yeas and nays entered into the journal. Constitutional Requirements for the Bill to Pass Article V, Section 26, 2 It has passed three readings on separate days. Printed copies in final form distributed to its members three days before its passage. Except, when the President certifies it is urgent to meet public calamity or emergency. But the factual basis of the presidential certification of bills may not be subjected to judicial review. It merely dispenses with the procedural requirements designed to ensure that bills are duly considered by members. Question mark, contention of petitioners, the certification of the bill is invalid because there was no emergency. The justification of growing budget deficit is not an unusual condition in this country. Held, the presidential certification dispenses not only printing and distribution of the copy of the bill but also the reading on separate days. The phrase except when the president certifies to the necessity of its immediate enactment qualifies the two stated conditions before a bill becomes a law. The unless clause must be read in relation to the except clause because they are coordinate clauses of the same sentence. To construe the except clause as simply dispensing the printing and distribution not only offends grammar but also negates the very premise of the except clause. The necessity of securing the immediate enactment of the bill which is certified in order to meet a public calamity or emergency. The factual basis of presidential certification of bills is not subject to judicial review pursuant to the principle of separation of powers as it merely involves doing away with procedural requirements. A law may not be declared unconstitutional when what is violated in its passage are mere internal rules of procedure. Unlike the sufficiency of the factual basis of the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus which threaten individual rights hence subject to judicial review. Conference Committee, it is a mechanism to harmonize differences between both houses in the passage of the bill into law, but it can deal generally with the subject matter. It may produce results beyond its mandate. The rules do not limit it to consider conflicting provisions only. It is empowered to include an entirely new provision not found in either bills. Thus, political scientists call the conference committee a third body of the legislature. A. A conference committee is constituted and is composed of members from each House of Congress to settle, reconcile or thresh out differences or disagreements on any provision of the bill. B. The conferees are not limited to reconciling the differences in the bill but may introduce new provisions germane to the subject matter or may report out an entirely new bill on the subject. c. The conference committee prepares a report to be signed by all the conferees and the chairman. d. The conference committee report is submitted for consideration, approval of both houses. No amendment is allowed. Illustrative case Tolentina v. Secretary of Finance, 235 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 630, 1994. Facts. The Conference Committee consolidated the House and Senate versions closed doors which resulted in an entirely different version. Contention of Petitioners. The House Committee report included provisions not found in either version and these were secretly inserted into it closed doors. Held, there is nothing wrong about closed-door executive sessions. Often, when only the conferences are present, it is the only way to harmonize conflicting provisions. The incomplete sentences in the transcripts may be attributed to the stenographer's own limitations or incoherence of statements. Amendment in the nature of a substitute by the conference committee resulting in a third version is allowed provided it is germane to the subject of both versions. Doctrine of Enrolled Bill. When both houses approve the conference committee report adopting third version of the bill, it is the latter that is the final and conclusive version submitted to the President for approval. The requirement of three readings on separate days and distribution of copies three days prior does not apply to conference committee reports. Under the Enrolled Bill Doctrine, the text of the Act as passed and approved is deemed importing absolute veracity and is binding on the courts. An enrolled copy of the bill is conclusive not only of its provisions but also of its due enactment.
once the Senate President and Speaker sign the bill and the Secretaries certify. Is the doctrine of enrolled bill absolute? No, in one case, the Senate President admitted to a mistake and withdrew his signature. Thus, the Supreme Court went behind the enrolled bill and consulted the journal to determine whether certain provisions of the statute had been approved by the Senate. There was no longer any enrolled bill to consider when the signature was withdrawn. Authentication of Bills The system of authentication devised is the signing by the Speaker and the Senate President of the printed copy of the approved bill to signify to the President that the bill being presented to him has been duly approved by the legislature and is ready for his approval or rejection. President's Approval or Veto Once the bill is approved, it is transmitted to the President of the Philippines for signature. The President may then either sign the bill to indicate approval, or veto the bill to indicate disapproval. If approved, the bill officially becomes a law. Override of Presidential Veto if the President decides to exercise his veto powers, the Congress may repass the vetoed bill if two-thirds of both houses, voting separately, approve its enactment. In this case, the bill also officially becomes a law. Three ways by which a bill becomes a law. A bill passed by Congress becomes a law in either of three ways. 1. When the President signs it. 2. When the President does not sign nor communicate his veto of the bill within 30 days after his receipt thereof. 3. When the vetoed bill is repassed by Congress by two-thirds vote of all its members, voting separately. Congress overrides veto. Parts of Statutes e. Title, the heading on the preliminary part, furnishing the name by which the Act is individually known. It is usually prefixed to the statute in the brief summary of its contents. The general statement of the subject of the bill. F. Preamble, part of statute explaining the reasons for its enactment and the objects sought to be accomplished. Usually, it starts with whereas. Part which follows the title and precedes the enacting clause. G. Enacting clause part of statute which declares its enactment and serves to identify it as an act of legislation proceeding from the proper legislative authority. B. Enacted is the usual formula used to start this clause. Proceeds body of statute identifies the bill as an act of legislation, absence does not nullify law unless required by the Constitution, not required by Constitution but used as a matter of legislative practice or custom. H body, the main and operative part of the statute containing its substantive and even procedural provisions. Provisos and exceptions may also be found. Main part of the bill, rights or remedies. I, policy section, declaration of state policy. J, definition section, defines terms. K, administrative section, enforcement body. L, standards of conduct do and avoid. M. Sanctions, penalties. N. Transitory provisions, temporary provisions for transition. O. Repealing clause, announces the prior statutes or specific provisions which have been abrogated by reason of the enactment of the new law. Repeal is not a legislative finding that the earlier law in unconstitutional. P. Saving clause, restriction in a repealing act which is intended to save rights, pending proceedings, penalties, etc. from the annihilation which would result from an unrestricted repeal. Q. Separability Clause, provides that in the event that one or more provisions are unconstitutional, the remaining provisions shall still be in force. If part of the law is declared invalid, the rest remains valid. Does not bind the courts. The whole statute may be nullified, if what is left is not complete or workable. R. Effectivity Clause, date of effectivity announces the effective date of the law. Time when law takes effect, usually after 15 days following completion of publication in the official gazette or in a newspaper of general circulation. 1 Title 1 Subject Rule Section 26, 1, Article V, 1987 Constitution. Every bill passed by the Congress shall embrace only one subject which shall be expressed in the title thereof. 
a bill embraces only one subject matter, to prevent lodge rolling, to prevent surprise or fraud, to inform the people. Tolentina v. Secretary of Finance, 235 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 630, 1994. Issue, an act restructuring the value-added tax, VAT, system, widening its tax base and enhancing its administration, and for these purposes amending and repealing the relevant provisions of the National Internal Revenue Code, as amended, and for other purposes. Held, to insist that the tax exemption be specified in the title is to require the title of the bill to be a complete index of its content. Every bill is required to embrace only one subject expressed in its title to prevent surprise upon members of the Congress and inform the people about it. If PAL did not know that its exemption was withdrawn, it is not due to the defect in the title but because just like other statutes, they pass unnoticed even if published. The title is sufficient if it expresses the general subject of the statute and all its provisions are germane to the general subject thus expressed. Lodge rolling, combination of multiple propositions in one proposal. Entire proposition is nullified, not only the subject matter. A legislative practice of embracing in one bill several distinct matters, none of which, perhaps, could singly obtain the assent of the legislature, and then procuring its passage by a combination of the minorities in favor of each of the measures into a majority that will adopt them all. Practice of including in one statute or constitutional amendment more than one proposition, inducing voters to vote for all, notwithstanding they might not have voted for all if amendments or statutes had been submitted separately. Lambina v. Kamalek, General Register No. 174153, October 25, 2006. Facts in 2006, the group led by Raul Lambino and Enrico Ormintado gathered signatures nationwide as People's Initiative to amend the Constitution by shifting from bicameral presidential to unicameral parliamentary form of government. It asked the people this proposition. Do you approve the amendment of Articles 6 and 7 of the 1987 Constitution? changing the form of government from the present bicameral presidential to a unicameral parliamentary system, and providing Article 18 as transitory provisions for the orderly shift from one system to the other? Held, for sure, the great majority of the 6.3 million Filipinos who signed the signature sheets did not see the full text of the proposition. They could have not known the nature and effect of the proposed changes. One. The term limits will be lifted and thus members of the parliament can be re-elected indefinitely. 2. The interim parliament can continue to function indefinitely until its members, who are almost all the present members of Congress, decide to call for new parliamentary elections. 3. Within 45 days from the ratification of the proposed changes, the interim parliament shall convene to propose further amendments or revisions to the constitution. The subject matter of this proposed transitory provision is totally unrelated to the shift from presidential bicameral to unicameral parliamentary system. This is lodge rolling. It places the people in a dilemma since they can answer only either yes or no to the entire proposition, which contains two subjects, one of which they may find unacceptable. Effects of insufficiency of title bill is void insofar as the subject matter not expressed in the title is concerned. But it void and valid are inseparable, the nullity of one vitiates the other. Go back to preamble. a. A statute whose title does not conform to the one title subject or is not related to its subject is null and void. b. If subject matter of statute is not sufficiently expressed in its title, only the unexpressed subject matter is void leaving the rest in force. Date of Effectivity When Laws Take Effect Article 2, Civil Code Laws take effect after 15 days following completion of publication in the official gazette, unless otherwise provided. Section 18, Chapter 5, Book I, 1987 Administrative Code Laws take effect after 15 days following completion of publication in the official gazette or in a newspaper of general circulation, unless it is otherwise provided. 
completion of publication, from which the date the period of publication will be counted, refers to the date of release of the OG or newspaper for circulation and not to its date, unless the two dates coincide. Tan Arda V. Tuvera, 146 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 446, 1986. Philippine Veterans Bank V. Vega, General Register No. 105364, June 28, 2001. Effectivity of Presidential Issuances, Rules and Regulations. The requirement of publication also applies to presidential issuances. Exceptions, those which are merely interpretative or internal in nature not concerning the public. Presidential Issuances, Basis Effectivity of Internal Rules and Regulations, IRR Nature of Administrative, Rules and Regulations A, whose purpose is to implement or enforce existing law pursuant to a valid delegation or to fill in the details of a statute, whether they are penal or non-penal. This requires publication. b. Those which are merely interpretative in nature or merely internal in character not concerning the public, does not need publication. In addition, the 1987 Administrative Code provide that a. Every agency shall file with the UP Law Center three copies of every rule adopted by it. Rules in force on the date of effectivity of this code which are not filed within three months from that date shall not be the basis of any sanction against any party or persons. b. Each rule shall become effective 15 days from the date of filing as above provided unless a different date is fixed by law, or specified in the rule in cases of imminent danger to public health, safety and welfare. Publication and filing requirements are indispensable to the effectivity or rules and regulations, except when the law authorizing its issuance dispenses the filing requirements. Types of Administrative Rules and Regulations IRR enforces the law. LOI interprets the rule. Rule making power of a public administrative agency, delegated legislative power. Test of Validity of Administrative Rules and Regulations, Test of Validity of Delegation of Rulemaking Power The law must be, complete in itself, fix a standard standard, the limits are sufficiently determinate or determinable, in case of discrepancy between statute and IRR, the statute prevails. When local ordinances take effect Local ordinance shall take effect after 10 days from the date a copy thereof is posted in the bulletin board at the entrance of the provincial capital or city, municipal, or barangay hall, as the case may be, and in at least two other conspicuous places in the local government unit. The Secretary of the Sanguinian shall cause the posting of the ordinance within five days after its approval. The gist of all ordinances with penal sanctions shall be published in a newspaper of general circulation, within the province where the local legislative body concerned belongs. In case of highly urbanized and independent component cities, the main feature of the ordinance or resolution duly enacted or adopted shall, in addition to being posted, be published once in a local newspaper of general circulation within the city. Unless a statute is by its provisions for a limited period only, it continues in force until changed or repealed by the legislature. Law once established continues until changed by some competent legislative power. It is not changed by change of sovereignty. Manner of computing time Where a statute requires the doing of an act within a specified number of days, such as ten days, from notice. It means one no calendar days and not working days. Where the word week is used as a measure of time and without reference to the calendar, it means a period of seven consecutive days without regard to the day of the week from which it begins, PNB versus CA. A. Year, 365 days. B. Month, 30 days except if the months are designated. C. Days, 24 hours. D. Night, from sunrise to sunset. E. Week, a period of seven consecutive days without regard to the day of the week from which it begins. Civil Code adopts the 365-day year and the 30-day month and not the 
calendar year nor the solar month. The exclude, the first and include the last day rule governs the computation of a period. If the last day falls on a Sunday or legal holiday, the act can still be done the following day. The principle does not apply to the computation of the period of prescription of crime, in which the rule is that if the last days in the period of prescription of a felony falls on a Sunday or legal holiday, the information concerning said felony cannot be filed on the next working day, as the offence has been by then already prescribed. Garvida v. Sales, General Register No. 124893, April 18, 1997. Fact, proclamation of a duly elected SK chair was suspended by the Cumelec because she is overaged. The law says candidates should not be more than 21 years old on the day of election. The SK chair however argued she is still 21 years, 10 months and 25 days old, not 22 years old. Held, the LGC speaks of years, not months or days and a year consists of 365 days. In computing years, first year is reached after completing first 365 days. So, 21 is 21 cycles of 365 days. Not more than 21 years old is not the same as less than 22 years old. Ordinance, defined. Ordinance, an act passed by the local legislative body in the exercise of its lawmaking authority. Test of valid ordinance. 1. Must not contravene the Constitution or any statute. 2. Must not be unfair or oppressive. 3. Must not be partial or discriminatory. 4. Must not prohibit but may regulate trade. 5. Must be general and consistent with public policy. And 6. Must not be unreasonable. Reason why an ordinance should not contravene a statute. Local councils exercise only delegated legislative powers conferred on them by Congress as the national law-making body. The delegate cannot be superior to the principal. Barangay Ordinance, Authority to Pass and Review Sangyang Barangay, smallest legislative body, may pass an ordinance affecting a barangay by a majority vote of all its members. Its ordinance is subject to review by Sangyuniang Bayan or Panlungsad, to determine if it is in accordance with municipal or city ordinance. Sangyuniang Bayan or Panlungsad shall take action on the ordinance within 30 days from submission. Municipal Ordinance, Authority to Pass, Veto and Review Sangyuniang Bayan, Affirmative Vote of a Major Erty of the Members of the Sangyuniang Bayan, the being a quorum. Ordinance is then submitted to the municipal mayor, who within 10 days from the receipt shall return it with his approval or veto. The ordinance is then submitted to Sangyuniang Panlaloigan for review, who within 30 days may invalidate it in whole or in part. City Ordinance, Authority to Pass, Veto and Review Sangyuniang Panlungsad, Affirmative Vote of a Majority of the Members of the Sangyuniang Bayan, the being a quorum. Approved ordinance shall be submitted to the mayor, who within 10 days shall return it with approval or his veto. The Sanguinian may repass a vetoed ordinance. If the city is a component city, the approved ordinance is submitted to the Sanguinian panel organ, who shall act within 30 days. Provincial ordinance, authority to pass and veto. Sanguinian panel organ, by a vote of a majority of the members present, the being a quorum enact ordinance that will affect the province. The ordinance is forwarded to the governor who, within 15 days shall return it with his approval or veto. A vetoed ordinance may be repassed by two-thirds vote. Resolution, defined. The determination or decision, in regard to its opinion or intention, of a deliberative or legislative body, public assembly, town council, board of directors or the like. Also a motion or formal proposition offered for adoption by such a body. In legislative practice, the term is usually employed to denote the adoption of a motion, 
the subject matter of which would not properly constitute a statute, such as a mere expression of opinion, an alteration of the rules, a vote of thanks or of censure, etc. in practice. The judgment of the court. In the civil law. The cancellation or annulling, by the act of parties or judgment of a court, of an existing contract which was valid and binding, in consequence of some cause or matter arising after the making of the agreement, and not in consequence of any inherent vice or defect, which, invalidating the contract from the beginning, would be ground for rescission. Law Dictionary What is resolution? Definition of resolution. Black's Law Dictionary Resolutions convey principles and sentiments of the Senate or the House of Representatives. These resolutions can further be divided into three different elements. A. Joint resolutions, require the approval of both chambers of Congress and the signature of the President, and have the force and effect of a law if approved. B. Concurrent resolutions, used for matters affecting the operations of both chambers of Congress and must be approved in the same form by both houses but are not transmitted to the President for his signature and therefore have no force and effect of the law. c. Simple resolutions, deal with matters entirely within the prerogative of one chamber of Congress, are not referred to the President for his signature, and therefore have no force and effect of the law. Kinds of resolutions. Simple. It is usually designated with P.S. Rees. A simple resolution deals with matters entirely within the prerogative of one House of Congress, such as adopting or receiving its own rules. A simple resolution is not considered by the other chamber and is not sent to the President for his signature. Like a concurrent resolution, it has no effect and force of the law. Simple resolutions are used occasionally to express the opinion of a single House on a current issue. Oftentimes, it is also used to call for a congressional action on an issue affecting national interest. Concurrent A concurrent resolution is usually designated in the Senate as Supreme Court trees. It is used for matters affecting the operations of both houses and must be passed in the same form by both of them. However, they are not referred to the President for his signature, and they do not have the force of law. Concurrent resolutions are used to fix the time of adjournment of a Congress and to express the sense of Congress on an issue. Joint A joint resolution, like a bill, requires the approval of both houses and the signature of the President. It has the force and effect of a law if approved. There is no real difference between a bill and a joint resolution. The latter generally is used when dealing with a single item or issue such as a continuing or emergency appropriations bill. Joint resolutions are also used for proposing amendments to the Constitution. Validity of statute Every statute passed by legislature is presumed to be valid because the legislature is supposed to have considered the question of its validity before approving it. In cases of doubt, the court resolves in favor of its validity. Presumption of constitutionality in deference to the wisdom, integrity and patriotism of the legislature, all reasonable doubts are ruled in favor of constitutionality. To doubt is to sustain. Presumption of Constitutionality The presumption is always in favor of constitutionality. However, if the statute is really unconstitutional, the courts are not only authorized but must declare its unconstitutionality. The court must see to it that the other departments have not exceeded their constitutional authority. Essence of separation of powers and system of check and balance. Authority to declare law unconstitutional. The final authority to declare a law unconstitutional is the Supreme Court and Bank by the concurrence of majority of the members who actually took part in the deliberations. Trial courts have jurisdiction to initially decide the issue of constitutionality of a law in appropriate cases. Article 8, Section 4, 2, 1987 Constitution, Supreme Court and Bank, concurrence of majority of its members who actually took part in the deliberations and voted. Essential Requisites for Judicial Review 1. Existence of an appropriate case, actual case, controversy. 2. An interest personal and substantial by the party raising the constitutionality, 
locus standi, legal standing. 3. The plea that the function be exercised at the earliest opportunity slash raised at the earliest opportunity. 4. The necessity that the constitutional question to be passed upon in order to decide the case, lis motor. Lis motor, courts will deal with constitutionality issue only if it is unavoidable, very crux of the controversy. Illustrative case, Francisco Jr. versus House of Representatives, General Register No. 160261, November 10, 2003. Facts, in June 2003. Joseph Estrada filed an impeachment complaint against C.J. David and seven other associate judges for culpable violation of the Constitution, betrayal of public trust and other high crimes. It was endorsed by three legislators are referred to the House Committee on Justice which ruled that it was sufficient in form but dismissed it for not being sufficient in substance. But the committee report was not sent to the House in plenary. In October 2003, a second impeachment complaint was filed against C.J. David. Contention of petitioners, the second impeachment complaint was unconstitutional because it violates Section 5, Article 9 of the Constitution which prohibits filing of impeachment complaint against the same official twice within a period of one year. Contention of respondents, the Supreme Court is without jurisdiction to hear much less prohibit or enjoin the lower house to perform its constitutionally mandate duty to initiate impeachment proceedings, it being a co-equal and independent branch of the government. The Senate has the sole power, authority and jurisdiction to try and decide impeachment cases. The petition are premature, no justiciable issue has been presented before it since its constitutional duty to constitute itself as impeachment court commences only upon receipt of the articles of impeachment, which it had not. Issue, whether the essential requisites for the exercise of judicial review have been fulfilled? In answering the issue, the Supreme Court addressed the following requisites for the exercise of judicial review. Locus standi ripeness, political question slash justiciability slash judicial restraint. Locus standi, defined. Personal or substantial interest in the case such that the party has sustained or will sustain direct injury. Contention of Soriano, only the Chief Justice has sustained or will sustain injury. Contention of petitioners, they sue in their respective capacities as taxpayers, citizens, voters, legislator, and association. As such, they stand to suffer injury. What to show if you petition as a citizen, the law or government act is invalid, sustains or is an imminent danger to sustain direct injury as a result of its enforcement, interest must be direct and personal, if it is an assertion of a public right. The mere fact that he or she is a citizen satisfies the requirement. What to show if you petition as a taxpayer, sufficient interest in preventing illegal expenditure of public funds, sustains direct injury as a result of the enforcement of the invalid law, public funds are either illegally dispersed, deflected to any improper purpose, wasted through enforcement of an invalid or constitutional law. What to show if you petition as legislator, infringement of prerogatives as legislator, standing to maintain inviolate prerogatives, powers and privileges vested by the Constitution in his office. Contention of Salonga, there is no urgent need for the Constitution to act right away. Anyway, it is the final arbiter of questions on constitutionality. All remedies in the House and Senate should first be exhausted. Position of Dean Pangalangan, the Supreme Court should take judicial of ongoing attempts to encourage signatories to withdraw their endorsement. House impeachment rules afford its members opportunity to raise constitutionality issues when the articles of impeachment are presented to the Senate. Even if the articles of impeachment are transmitted to the Senate, the Chief Justice may still move to dismiss on ground of constitutional infirmity. Held. The withdrawal of signatures neither cures the House impeachment rules of its constitutional defect nor obliterates the questioned second impeachment complaint. 
it is useless to seek remedies from either the lower or upper house because it has no jurisdiction to the rule on the issue of constitutionality. Political question, defined, refers to those questions which, under the Constitution, are to be decided by the people in their sovereign capacity, or in regard to which full discretionary authority has been delegated to the legislature or executive branch of the government. It is a question of policy, concerned with wisdom and not legality. Except, grave abuse discretion amounting to lack or excessive jurisdiction. Determination of impeachable offense, purely political question left to the sound discretion of the legislature. Lis mota, defined, courts will touch the issue of constitutionality unless it is unavoidable or is the very crux of the controversy. Whether section 15 or 16 of Rule 5 of the House impeachment rules are unconstitutional for violating section 3, Article 11 of the Constitution? Whether, as a result, the second impeachment is barred under section 3, 5, Article 11 of the Constitution? Under section 16, impeachment proceedings are deemed initiated on the day the House Committee on Justice finds that the verified complaint is sufficient in substance. Contention of respondents, since the first impeachment complaint was dismissed for being insufficient in substance, it was not deemed initiated hence the second impeachment complaint is allowed. Initiate does not mean to file. Held, initiate means filing of the impeachment complaint and referral to the House Committee on Justice or filing by at least one-third of the House of Representatives with the Secretary General of the House. Once initiated, no other impeachment complaint shall be filed against the same official for a period of one year. Judicial Restraint Contention of Pimentel, the SC should exercise judicial restraint because the Senate, as an impeachment court, has the sole power to hear and decide all impeachment cases. Contention of De Venetia, there is a moral compulsion for the Supreme Court to not assume jurisdiction because its members are subject to the impeachment. Held, the power of judicial review includes the power to review justiciable issues in impeachment proceedings. SC together with all other courts has long held and been entrusted with the judicial power to resolve conflicting legal rights regardless of the personalities involved in the suits or actions. Test of constitutionality of statutes. A statute may be declared unconstitutional because 1. It is not within the legislative power to enact. 2. Or it creates or establishes methods or forms that infringe constitutional principles. 3. Its purpose or effect violates the Constitution. 4. It is vague. It is vague when it lacks comprehensive standards that men of common intelligence must necessarily guess at its meaning and differ in its application. 5. The change of circumstances or conditions may affect the validity of some statutes especially those so-called emergency laws designed specifically to meet certain contingencies. Avoid for vagueness rule. Violates due process. People are not informed on what conduct to avoid. Related to overbreadth. This doctrine holds that a law is facially invalid if men of common intelligence must necessarily guess at its meaning and differ as to its application. It is subject to the same principle governing the overbreadth doctrine. For one, it is also an analytical tool for testing on their faces statutes in free speech cases. And like overbreadth, it is said that a litigant may challenge a statute on its face only if it is vague in all its possible applications. Overbreadth Doctrine Doctrine of Overbreadth Constitution Law An exception to the prohibition against third-party standing, the doctrine permits a person to challenge a statute on the ground that it violates the free speech rights of third parties not before the court, even though the law is constitutional as applied to that defendant. In other words, the overbreadth doctrine provides that, given a case or controversy, a litigant whose own activities are unprotected may nevertheless challenge a statute by showing that it substantially abridges their free speech rights of other parties not before the court. Kemerinsky, Constitution Law, page 86, second edition, 2002. Compare with doctrine of void for vagueness.
Test of Constitutionality of Ordinances The test of validity are 1. Must not contravene the Constitution or any statute. 2. Must not unfair or oppressive. 3. Must not be partial or discriminatory. 4. Must not prohibit but may regulate trade. 5. Must not be general and consistent with public policy. 6. Must not be unreasonable. Effects of unconstitutionality. The general rule is that an unconstitutional act is not a law. a. It confers no rights. b. It affords no protection. c. It imposes no duties. d. It creates no office. e. It is inoperative as though it had never been passed. Regard should be had to what has been done while the statute was in operation and presumed to be valid. Hence, its operative fact before a declaration of nullity must be recognized. Two views on the effects of a declaration of unconstitutionality of a statute. 1. Orthodox view. Article 7, Civil Code. Operative fact. An unconstitutional law confers no right, is not a law, imposes no duties, and affords no protection. In legal contemplation, it is inoperative, as if it had not been passed. Article 7, Civil Code. Operative Fact Doctrine, as a general rule, the nullification of an unconstitutional law or act carries with it the illegality of its effects. However, in cases where the nullification of its effects will result in inequity and injustice, the operative fact doctrine may apply, and the effects of the unconstitutional act will have to be recognized. Existence of statute prior to nullity is an operative fact that must be recognized, statute was in force and complied with and so parties have already acted under it. 2. Modern view. The court in passing upon the question of constitutionality does not annul or repeal the statute if it is unconstitutional, it simply refuses to recognize it and determines the rights of the parties just as if the statute had no existence. It does not repeal, supersede, revoke or annul the statute. The parties to the suit are concluded by the judgment, but no one else is bound. Partial invalidity. The general rule is that where part of a statute is void as repugnant to the Constitution, while another part is valid, the valid portion if separable from the invalid, may stand and be enforced must be complete and intelligible to enforce legislative intent. Exemptions to this rule, when the parts are so mutually dependent and connected to each other, legislature is presumed to have intended them as a whole. Nullity of one vitiates the rest. Separability clause, intent of separability, rather than complete nullity. The presence of separability clause creates the presumption that the legislature intended separability, rather than complete nullity of the statute. Tatad v. Secretary of Department of Energy, 281 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 330, 1997, Separability Clause Facts The Supreme Court declared unconstitutional three provisions of Republic Act 8180 or an act deregulating the downstream oil industry, the provisions on 4% tariff differential minimum inventory and predatory pricing which were declared anti-competition. These provisions are the key provisions of Republic Act 8180. Issue, whether the nullity, striking down, of the three provisions of the law infect the entire law even with the presence of the separability clause? Held, yes. Because to decree partial unconstitutionality of Republic Act 8180 will bring about absurdity separability clause is not binding with the Supreme Court. Separability clause only creates a presumption of that the act is severable. It is merely an aid in statutory construction. IT is not an inexorable command. A separability clause does not clothe the valid parts with immunity from the invalidating effect the law gives to the inseparable blending of the bad with the good. The separability clause cannot also be applied if it will produce an absurd result. In sum, if the separation of the statute will defeat the intent of the legislature, separation will not take place despite the inclusion of a separability clause in there. Midterms
Part 3. Cardinal Rules of Construction. How to Ascertain Legislative Intent. Ascertain Legislative Intent. Statute as a whole. Not isolated part or provision. Once known, no other choice but to apply it. If transparent, construction is dispensed with. The object of all interpretation and construction of statutes is to ascertain the meaning and intention of the legislature, to the end that the same may be enforced. Legislative intent is determined principally from the language of the statute. Verb legis. If the language of the statute is plain and free from ambiguity, and express a single, definite, and sensible meaning, that meaning is conclusively presumed to be the meaning which the legislature intended to convey, statutes as a whole. A cardinal rule in statutory construction is that legislative intent must be ascertained from a consideration of the statute as a whole and not merely of the particular provision. A word or phrase might easily convey a meaning which is different from the one actually intended. A statute should be construed as a whole because it is not to be presumed that the legislature has used any useless words, and because it is dangerous practice to base the construction upon only a part of it, since one portion may be qualified by other portions. Spirit and Purpose of the Law When the interpretation of a statute according to the exact and literal import of its words would lead to absurd or mischievous consequences, or would thwart or contravene the manifest purpose of a legislature in its enactment, it should be construed according to its spirit and reason, disregarding or modifying, so far as may be necessary, the strict letter of the law. When the reason of the law ceases, the law itself ceases. Doctrine of Necessary Implications What is implied in a statute is as much a part thereof as that which is expressed. Casus Emissus when a statute makes specific provisions in regard to several enumerated cases or objects, but omits to make any provision for a case or object which is analogous to those enumerated, or which stands upon the same reason, and is therefore within the general scope of the statute, and it appears that such case or object was omitted by inadvertence or because it was overlooked or unforeseen, it is called a casus omissus. Such omissions or defects cannot be supplied by the courts. The rule of casus omissus pro omisso hey bendesist can operate and apply only if and when the omission has been clearly established. Stare decisis. It is the doctrine that, when court has once laid down a principle, and apply it to all future cases, where facts are substantially the same, regardless of whether the parties and properties are the same. Stare decisis. Follow past precedents and do not disturb what has been settled. Matters already decided on the merits cannot be relitigated again and again. Stare decisis et non quieta movia, follow past precedents and do not disturb what has been settled. Liberal or strict construction, factors to consider and when applied. Form a law on the matter. Persons or matters with which it deals. Let all language of the law. Generally, whether a statute is to be given a strict or liberal construction will be depend upon the nature of the statute, the purpose to be subserved and the mischief to be remedied, and a strict or liberal interpretation will be given a statute that will best accomplish the end desired and effectuate legislative intent. Strict construction, generally strict construction is that construction according to the letter of a statute, which recognizes nothing that is not expressed takes the language used in its exact meaning, and admits no equitable consideration. It does not mean giving a statute its narrowest meaning of which it is susceptible. Nor does it mean that words shall be so restricted as not to have their full meaning. Scope of statute shall not be extended or enlarged by implication, intendment, or equitable consideration beyond the literal meaning of its terms. Liberal Construction, Defined Liberal constructions mean such equitable construction as will enlarge of a statute to accomplish its intended purpose, carry out its intent, or promote justice. It does not mean enlargement of a provision which is clear, unambiguous and free from doubt, for a statute which is plain and clear is not subject to construction.
Liberal construction is that construction which expands the meaning of a statute to meet cases which are clearly within the spirit or reason thereof or within the evil which the statute was designed to remedy, or which give the statute its generally accepted meaning to the end that the most comprehensive application thereof may be accorded, without being inconsistent with its language or doing violence to any of its terms. Liberal construction means that the words should receive a fair and reasonable interpretation, so as to attain the intent, spirit and purpose of the law. Liberal construction applied, generally. The literal meaning of the words used may be rejected if the result of adopting said meaning would be to defeat purpose of the law. Liberal interpretation so as to save the statute from obliteration, are trees magis valit quamperit. Construction by this nature and the act of the court in engrafting upon a law something which it believes ought to have been embraced therein. The former is liberal construction and is a legitimate exercise of judicial power. The latter is judicial legislation forbidden by the tripartite division of powers among the three departments of government, the executive, the legislative and the judicial. A statute may not be liberally construed to read into it something which its clear and plain language rejects. Statutes in derogation of common rights, how construed? Statutes in derogation of rights. People in Republican state enjoy certain rights, which are either inherent or guaranteed by the Constitution or protected by law. Rights are not absolute, and the state, in the exercise of its police power, may enact legislations curtailing or restricting their enjoyment. As these statutes are in derogation of common or general rights, they are generally strictly construed and rigidly confined to cases clearly within their scope or purpose, two reasonably possible constructions, one which would diminish or restrict fundamental right of the people and the other of which would not do so. The latter construction must be adopted so as to allow full enjoyment of such fundamental right. In case of doubt, strictly construed against the law in favor of common rights. Common rights, examples. Personal liberty, property, freedom of contract, exercise of any trade or profession. Statutes prescribing formalities of wills, how construed. Statutes prescribing formalities of will. Statutes prescribing the formalities to be observed in the execution of wills are strictly construed, a will must be executed in accordance with the statutory requirements, otherwise it is entirely void, apply the intent of the legislators and not that of the testator, and the latter's intention is frequently defeated by the non-observance of what the statute requires. In case of doubt, strictly construed against the validity of the will since the testator is already dead. Dead men tell no tale. Failure to comply with required written formalities. Fatal. There will cannot be admitted to probate. Naturalization laws, how construed. Laws on naturalization are strictly construed against an applicant for citizenship and rigidly followed and enforced. Right of an alien to become a citizen by naturalization is a statutory rather than a natural one and it does not become vested until he files a petition and establishes by competent and satisfactory evidence that he has all the qualifications and none of the disqualifications specified by law. In case of doubt, strictly construed in favor of the government against the applicant. Requirements for naturalization must be complied to the letter to ensure that undesirable aliens are not naturalized. Statue conferring the right of eminent domain how construed. In case of doubt, against the government. It derogates private rights to property and ownership. Statutes granting rights to laborers, how construed. In case of doubt, liberally construed in favor of labor, labor law is social legislation. Statutes granting tax exemptions, how construed. Statutes granting tax exemptions. Taxes are what the people pay for civilized society, lifeblood of the nation. The law frowns against exemptions from taxation. Laws granting tax exemptions are thus construed strictly some e juries against the taxpayer and liberally in favor of the taxing authority. Taxation is the rule and exemption is the exception.
The burden of proof rests upon the party claiming exemption to prove that it is in fact covered by the exemption so claimed. Statutes granting tax exemptions are construed stricter semi juris against the taxpayer and liberally in favor of the taxing authority. Basis, to minimize the different treatment and foster impartiality, fairness and equality of treatment among taxpayers. For exemptions from taxation are not favored in law, nor are they presumed. They must be expressed in the clearest and the most unambiguous language and not left to mere implications. Exemptions are never presumed. The burden is on the claimant to establish clearly his right to exemption and an alleged grant of exemption will be strictly construed and cannot be made out by inference or implications but must be beyond reasonable doubt. In other words, since taxation is the rule and exemption the intention to make an exemption ought to be expressed in clear and unambiguous terms. In case of doubt, strictly against the taxpayer. Taxation is the lifeblood of the government. Prospective and retrospective interpretation, distinguished. Prospective applies to such facts and causes after its enactment. Retrospective, applies to such facts and causes before its enactment. General rule, statutes are construed prospectively unless clearly stated otherwise in the statute. In case of doubt, resolved against retrospective effect, in favor of prospective construction. Prospective statute, is a statute which operates upon acts and transactions which have not occurred when the statute takes effect, that is, which regulates the future. Retrospective or retroactive law, is one which takes away or impairs vested rights acquired under existing laws, or creates new obligations and imposes new duties, or attaches new disabilities in respect of transaction already passed. A sound canon of statutory construction is that statutes operate prospectively only and never retrospectively, unless the legislative intent to the contrary is made manifest either by the express terms of the statute or by necessary implication. The Civil Code of the Philippines follows the above rule thus, laws shall have no retroactive effect, unless the contrary is provided. Retroactive legislation is looked upon with disfavor as a general rule and properly so because of its tendency to be unjust and oppressive. Penal statutes. Penal statutes as a rule are applied prospectively. Felonies and misdemeanors are punished under the laws in force at the time of their commission. Article 366, Revised Penal Code. However, as an exception, it can be given retroactive effect if it is favorable to the accused who is not a habitual criminal. Article 22, Revised Penal Code. Procedural laws are retrospective. Statutes regulating the procedure of the court will be construed as applicable to actions pending and undermined at the time of their passage. However, rules of procedure should not be given retroactive effect if it would result in great injustice and impair substantive right. Procedural provisions of the local government code are retrospective. Curative statutes. They are those which undertake to cure errors and irregularities and administrative proceedings, and which are designed to give effect to contracts and other transactions between private parties which otherwise would fail of producing their intended consequences by reason of some statutory disability or failure to comply with some technical requirement. They are therefore retroactive in their character. Effect of retrospective application of law takes away or impairs vested rights acquired under existing law, creates new obligations, imposes new duties, attaches disability in respect of transactions or consideration already passed. Ex post facto law. Rule, no ex post facto laws shall be enacted. Makes an act done before the passage of the law and which is innocent when done, and punishes such act applies only to criminal or penal matters and not to civil laws. Article 3, Section 22, 1987 Constitution. No ex post facto law or bill of attainder shall be enacted. An ex post facto law is any of the following. A law which makes criminal an act done before the passage of the law and which was innocent when done, and punishes such act. A law which aggravates a crime 
or makes it greater than it was, when committed. A law which changes the punishment and inflicts greater punishment than that annexed to the crime when committed. A law which alters the legal rules of evidence, and authorizes conviction upon less or different testimony than the law required at the time of the commission of the offense. A law which assumes to regulate civil rights or remedies only, but in effect imposes penalty or deprivation of a right for something which when done was lawful. A law which deprives a person accused of a crime of some lawful protection to which he has become entitled, such as protection of a former conviction or acquittal, or a proclamation of amnesty. Test whether prohibition against ex post facto clause is violated. Does the retroactive application of the law take from the accused any right that was regarded at that time as vital for the protection of life and liberty? Scope of prohibition against ex post facto law applies only to criminal or penal matters, not to laws which concern civil proceedings generally, or which affect or regulate civil or private rights or political privilege. Ex post facto law prohibited, exception. Unless it is favorable to the accused, Article 22, Revised Penal Code This is founded on conscience and good law and contained in Aphorism, favorabilia sant ampliander, adiosa stringenda, laws that are favorable to the accused are given retroactive effect. If it favors the accused. Exception to the exception. When the accused is a habitual delinquent. Where the later statutes expressly provide that it shall not apply to existing statutes, actions or pending cases. Accused disregards the later law and invokes the prior statute under which he was prosecuted. A mandatory statute which renders an illegal act prior to enactment legal is generally given retroactive effect unless it is expressly provide that such statute will not apply retroactively. Bill of Attainder, defined. Legislative act which inflicts punishment without judicial trial. Rule. No Bill of Attainder shall be enacted Bill of Attainder is a legislative act, which inflicts punishment without judicial trial. If a law is Bill of Attainder, it is an ex post facto law. If it is not an ex post facto law, it is not a Bill of Attainder. Bills of Pains and Penalties, if the punishment be less than death. Part 4. Particular Rules of Construction. Verb Legus or Plain Meaning Rule. Plain meaning rule. When the words and phrases of the statute are clear and unequivocal, their meaning must be determined from the language employed and the statute must be taken to mean exactly what it says. What is not clearly provided in the law cannot be extended to those matters outside of scope. Where the law is clear, appeals to justice and equity as justification to construe it differently are unavailing. Verb leg is plain meaning rule. Where the statute is clear, plain and free from ambiguity, it must be given its literal meaning and applied without interpolation. Index animi sermoist. Speech is the index of intention. Dura lex st lex. The law may be harsh, but it is still the law. The reason for the rule is that the legislature must be presumed to know the meaning of the words to have used the words advisedly and to have expressed its intent by the use of such words as are found in the statute. Ratio legis. In construing a statute, the court looks into the spirit and reason of the law. If adherence to the letter of the law leads to absurdity, injustice, contradictions or defeat the plain purpose of the law ratio legis applies. Apparent inaccuracies and mistakes in mere verbiage or phraseology will be overlooked to give effect to the spirit of the law. What is within the spirit is within the law. The spirit of the law controls the letter. Ratio legis, reason of the law. Literal import must yield to intent. Where legislative intent apparently conflicts with the letter of the law, the former prevails over the latter. Primary rule in construction is to ascertain and give effect to the intent. In construing a statute, the courts must look into the spirit of the law or their reason for it. The spirit or intention of the law prevails over the latu thereof. The statute may be extended to cases which are not included within the literal meaning of the words, if such case is within the reason for the statute.
and the cases within the letter at the law but not within the spirit thereof are not within the statute. No reason, however, may be imputed to the legislature, which is not supported by the fact of the law itself. In determining the reason for the law, recourse may be had to the preamble or applicable where adherence to the latter would lead to absurdity, injustice, contradiction or defeat the plain purpose of the act. Apparent inaccuracies did and mistakes in the mere verbiage or phraseology will be overlooked to give effect to the spirit of the law. Men's Legislatories Courts look into the following, object to be accomplished, evils and mischief to be remedied, purpose to be observed, statute liberally construed to serve its purpose even if its literal interpretation says otherwise. When the language of a particular provision of law admits of two interpretations, the one that gives effect to the intent must be followed. The courts look into the object to be accomplished, the evils and mischief to be remedied or the purpose to be observed. The court should give the statute a reasonable or liberal construction which will best affect its purpose rather than one which will defeat it even though such construction is not within the strict literal interpretation of the statute. The court should give the statute a reasonable or liberal construction which will best affect its purpose rather than one which will defeat it. Statutes must be construed to avoid injustice. Ejusdem generis. Where general term follows particular things, the general term is construed to include those things or persons of the same class as those specifically enumerated. Example, trustees, agents, attorneys at law and other persons. Other persons, only such persons in similar position o trust like guardians. While general words or expressions in a statute are, as a rule, accorded their full, natural, and generic sense, they will not be given such meaning if they are used in association with specific words or phrases. General rule is that where a general word or phrase follows an enumeration of particular and specific words of the same class or where the latter follow the former, the general word or phrase is to be construed to include, or to be restricted to, persons, things, or cases akin to, resembling, or of the same kind or class as those specifically mentioned. Where a statute describes things of particular class or kind, Accompanied by words of a generic character, the generic words will usually be limited to things of a kindred nature with those particularly enumerated, unless there be something in the context of the statute to repel such inference. Ejusdem generis, purpose, gives effect, both specific and general words. Particular words indicate the class and the general includes all embraced in said class although not specifically named. Purpose give effect to both the particular and general words, by treating the particular words as indicating the class and the general words as indicating all that is embraced in said class, although not specifically named by particular words. This principle is based on the proposition that had the legislature intended the general words to be used in their generic and unrestricted sense, it would not have enumerated the specific words. Application, where specific and generic terms of the same nature are employed in the same act, the latter following the former, redendo singular singulis. The variation of the doctrine of last antecedent is the rule of redendo singular singulis. The maxim means referring each to each, referring each phrase or expression to its appropriate object, or let each be put in its proper place, that is, the words should be taken distributively. Redendo singular singulis requires that the antecedents and consequences should be read distributively to the effect that each word is to be applied to the subject to which it appears by context most appropriately related and to which it is most applicable. Doctrine of Collocation Lacuna versus Ubs, 133 Philippines 770, 773 774, 1968 association between two words that are typically or frequently used together where the sentence has several antecedents and consequence, they are to be read distributively. Antecedent, a word or phrase that a subsequent or consequent word refers to. Consequent, a word or phrase that an antecedent word precedes. Example, statutory construction is an easy subject. 
but the professor somehow makes it difficult. Distributive, refers to each member of the group individually and separately. Examples of distributive words, each, every and either. Statutory construction is an easy subject, but the professor somehow makes it difficult. Each student enrolled in the class may either pass or fail, without fear or favor. Expression unia sixt exclusion alterius. Mention of one thing implies the exclusion of another. Example, female lawyers underscore are required to wear uniform on underscore. Express mention of one person, thing or consequence implies the exclusion of all others. It is formulated in a number of ways. A. One variation of the rules is the principle that what is expressed puts an end to that which is implied expressum facit ses er tas item. B. General expression followed by exceptions therefrom implies that those which do not fall under the exceptions come within the scope of the general expression. Exceptio firmat regular min casibus non exceptis. C. Expression of one or more things of a class implies the exclusion of all not expressed, even though all would have been implies had none been expressed. The rule expressio unius is exclusio alterius and its variations are canons of restrictive interpretation. Basis, legislature would not have made specified enumerations in a statute had the intention been not to restrict its meaning and confine its terms to those expressly mentioned. They are opposite the doctrine of necessary implication. 19. Negative opposite doctrine. The principle that what is expressed puts an end to that which is implied is also known as negative positive doctrine or argumentum a contrario. 20. Application of expressio unius rule. The rule of expressio unius is exclusio alterius and its corollary canons are generally used in the construction of statutes granting powers creating rights and remedies, restricting common rights, and imposing penalties and forfeitures, as well as those statutes which are strictly construed. Where a statute directs the performance of certain acts by a particular person or class or persons, it implies that it shall not be done otherwise or be a different person or class of persons. If a statute enumerates the things upon which it is to operate, everything else must necessarily, and by implication, be excluded. 21. Limitations of Rule The rule expressio unius is exclusio alterius is not a rule of law. It is a mere tool of statutory construction or a means of ascertaining the legislative intent. The rule, not being inflexible nor a mechanical or technical tool, must yield to what is clearly a legislative intent. It is no more than an auxiliary rule of interpretation to be ignored where other circumstances indicate that the enumeration was not intended to be exclusive. It should applied only as a means of discovering legislative intent and should not be permitted to defeat the plainly indicated purpose of the legislature. It will not apply where the enumeration is by way of example or to remove doubts only. It will not apply in case a statute appears upon its face to limit the operation of its provisions to particular persons or things by enumerating them, but no reason exists why other persons or things not so enumerated should not have been included and manifest injustice will follow by not including them. The rule may be disregarded if it will result to incongruities or a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, inconvenience, hardship and injury to the public interest. Where the legislative intent shows that the enumeration is not exclusive, the maxim does not apply. Nocita assesses. Meaning of particular terms in a statute may be ascertained by reference to words associated with or related to them in statute. Casus omissus. Words or phrases may be supplied by the courts and inserted in a statute where it is necessary to eliminate repugnancy and inconsistency to complete the sense and give effect to the intent. Used to supply omissions caused by clerical errors, by accident or inadvertence. The rule of casus omissus pro omisso hay bendicist states that a person, object or thing omitted from an enumeration must be held to have been omitted intentionally. Principle proceeds from a reasonable certainty that a particular person, 
object or thing has been omitted from a legislative enumeration. The rule does not apply where it is shown that the legislature did not intend to exclude the person, thing, object from the enumeration. If such legislative intent is clearly indicated, the court may supply the omission if to do so will carry out the clear intent of the legislature and will not do violence to its language. Casus omissus, conditions for application. Only if palpable and the omitted words are plainly indicated in the context or verifiable from other parts of the statute. 5. Construction of words and phrases. May and shall, distinguished. May, permissive and operates to confer discretion. Shall, imperative with a duty to enforce. Use of the word may in the statute generally connotes a permissible thing and operates to confer discretion while the word shall is imperative, operating to impose a duty which may be enforced. The term shall may be either as mandatory or directory depending upon a consideration of the entire provision in which it is found, its object and consequences that would follow from construing it one way or the other. Depending upon a consideration of the entire provision, its nature, its object, and the consequences that would follow from construing it one way or the other, the convertibility of said terms either as mandatory or directory is a standard recourse in statutory construction. It is well settled that the word may should be read as shall where such construction is necessary to give effect to the apparent intention of the legislature. The word may will, as a rule, be construed as shall where a statute provides for the doing of some act which is required by justice or public duty or where it vests a public body or officer with power and authority to take such action which concerns the public interest or rights of individuals. The word shall may be construed as may when so required by the context or intention of the legislature. It shall be construed merely as permissive when no public benefit or private right requires that it be given an imperative meaning. Jingona v. Carrig, General Register No. 94571, April 22, 1991. Facts Congress earmarked 86 billion for debt servicing and 27 billion for education. This was challenged as unconstitutional because Section 5, Article 14 of the 1987 Constitution says, the state shall assign the highest budgetary priority to education 20. Held. While it is true that it mandates Congress to assign the highest budgetary priority to education, it does not follow that the hands of Congress are so hamstrung as to deprive it the power to respond to the imperatives of national interest and for the attainment of other state policies or objectives. The use of the word shall is not always mandatory. It may be construed as merely directory depending on legislative intent or when the provision involved is not self-executing. Special or Technical Meaning Words and phrases having technical or special meaning are construed in their technical sense. This applies to terms with established trade, business, commercial or professional significance. Exception when intended otherwise by Congress or it defeats legislative intent. Illustrative Case, Asiatic Petroleum Company vs. Collector, 30 Philippines 510. Facts A tax law provides that no tax shall be collected on such article which before the taking effect of this act, shall have been disposed of to persons other than manufacturers or wholesale dealer. Held. No. The oil was not disposed of. Had the legislature intended disposed of to mean sold and delivered, it would have used the latter phrase. The legislative evidently took into consideration the custom of merchants in using the phrase of in its commercial and not technical sense. Conjunctive and disjunctive or and means conjunction connecting words or phrases expressing the idea that the latter is to be added or taken along with the first. Conjunctive article or is a disjunctive particle used to express as alternative or to give a choice of one among two or more things.
It is also used to clarify what has already been said, and in such cases, means in other words, to wit, or that is to say. Disjunctive article indicating an alternative. When used, the various members of the sentence are to be taken jointly. All, any, every. All, universal or comprehensive sense. Example, all female law students are required to wear corporate attire every Wednesday. Any, restrictive interpretation in some cases. Example, any female law student who does not wear corporate attire on a Wednesday is required to wear it every day. Every, word of inclusion. Example, every female law student in the University of San Carlos College of Law is required to wear corporate attire every Wednesday etc. and so forth on the text of his statute. Grammar. Rules for language. The system of rules by which words are formed and put together to make sentences. Grammar. What rules apply? Ordinary rules of grammar to determine legislative intent. Grammar. Limitation. Not conclusive if it defeats legislative intent. Rules on punctuation, tense, gender and number, degree of aid. Very little weight. Punctuation. Morena v. Kamilek, General Registration No. 168550, August 10, 2006. Tense. Statutes expressed in the future may nevertheless be regarded as having present effect. Gender. The use of masculine gender does not preclude application to females where intent requires it. Number. Words importing singular number may be extended to several persons or things, unless it defeats legislative intent. Inaccuracies or clerical errors may be corrected by the court if it is necessary to carry out the legislative intent. Example. Courts of law was encoded instead on course of law. That it is a mere typographical error is evident. If uncorrected, it renders the law nonsensical. It must be corrected by the court as it is duty bound to give statute a sensible construction. A man wrote a book entitled How to Change Your Life. He was uncertain if it sells, since it appears predictable, as many other books of similar theme were already published prior to it. To his surprise, 10 million copies were sold on the first week they were out in the market. It turned out the title was inadvertently made How to Change Your Wife. Foreign Language Revised Penal Code was approved in its Spanish text but translated to English. In case of doubt, the Spanish prevails. Facts Congress earmarked 86B for debt servicing and 27B for education. This was challenged as unconstitutional because Section 5 Article 14 of the Constitution says Congress is mandated to assign the highest budgetary priority to education in order to ensure that teachings will attract and retain its rightful share of the best available talents through adequate remuneration and other means of job satisfaction and fulfillment, it does not thereby follow that. Self-executing provisions, does not need an enabling law. Prefinals. 6. Intrinsic aids in construction. Intrinsic aids, defined. In the printed page of the statute itself, you always see them within the face of the statute. The term intrinsic means internal or within. Intrinsic aids, therefore, are those aids within the statute. Intrinsic aids are resorted to only if there is ambiguity. In resorting to intrinsic aids, one must go back to the parts of the statute the title, the preamble, context or body, chapter and section headings, punctuation, and interpretation. Generally, where the meaning of a statute is ambiguous, the court may avail itself of all legitimate aids to construction in order that it can ascertain the true intent of the statute. Intrinsic aids, enumerated. Context. Punctuation and capitalization. Language or lingual text. Title. Chapter, Article and Section Headings. Marginal Notes. Preamble. Legislative Definitions and Interpretative Clauses. Context. 
the text surrounding word or passage. Words phrases or passages that come before and after a particular word or passage in a speech or piece of writing and help explain its full meaning. They must be taken as a whole and in relation to one another. Reason for the rule, the statute is enacted as a whole and not in parts or sections. Purpose of the rule, to give proper emphasis to each provision and avoid giving undue emphasis or effect to particular words, clauses, parts or group of words. If context admits of two interpretations, the one which tends to give effect to the manifest object of the law should be adopted. Reason why construe the law in its entirety? Because the law was enacted also in its entirety and it is not a piece by piece legislation. Legislative intent should accordingly be ascertained from a consideration of the whole context of the stature and not from an isolated part of particular provision. Aboites Shipping Corporation vs. City of Cebu. The best source from which to ascertain the legislative intent is the statute itself. The words, phrases, sentences, sections, clauses, provisions, taken as a whole and in relation to one another. Commissioner of Internal Revenue vs. TMX Sales Punctuation, aids of low degree and can never control the intelligible meaning of written words, may be used to clear ambiguities. Punctuation marks air aids of low degree and can never control against the intelligible meaning of written word. The reason is that punctuation marks are not part of a stature, nor are they part of the English language, for Lissi and O versus Aquino. A, semicolon, indicates a separation in the relation of the thought, a degree greater than that expressed by a comma. Makes the difference being that the semicolon makes the division a little more pronounced. B, comma, also separates the parts and sentences, but less pronounced than the comma. C period, used to indicate the end of a sentence. Note, an argument based upon punctuation alone is not persuasive, and the courts will not hesitate to change the punctuation when necessary, to give the statute the effect intended by the legislature. Punctuation, defined, standardized non-alphabetical symbols or marks that are used to organize writing into clauses, phrases, and sentences and in this way make its meaning clear. Grammatical marks. Coma, separate words. Semicolon, separate words, more pronounced, more emphatic than coma. Period, separates a sentence. Article 7, Section 16, 1987 Constitution. Section 16. The President shall nominate and, with the consent of the Commission on Appointments, appoint the heads of the executive departments, ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, or officers of the armed forces from the rank of colonel or naval captain, and other officers whose appointments are vested in him in this constitution. He shall also appoint all other officers whose appointments are not otherwise provided by law, and those whom he may be authorized by law to appoint. The Congress may, by law, vest the appointment of other officers lower in rank in the President alone, in the courts, or in the heads of departments, agencies, commissions, or boards. The President shall have the power to make appointments during the recess of the Congress, whether voluntary or compulsory, but such appointments shall be effective only until disapproval by the Commission on Appointments or until the next adjournment of the Congress. Calderon v. Carral, General Register No. 91636, April 23, 1992 capitalization, also in aid of low degree, in the construction of statute. Language or lingual text. a. Philippine laws are officially promulgated either in 1. English 2. Spanish 3. Filipino 4. or either in two such languages. b. Rules. a. If text is in English and Spanish, English text shall govern. b. But in case of ambiguity, omission, or mistake, the Spanish text may be consulted to express the English text. c. If statute is officially promulgated in Spanish, English or in Filipino with translations into other languages, the language in which it is written, 
promulgated, prevails over its translation. Language of promulgation prevails over language in translation. d. In the interpretation of a law administrative issuance promulgated in all the official languages, Filipino, the English text shall control, unless otherwise specifically provided. In case of ambiguity, omission or other mistake, the other texts may be consulted. For consultation only, merely persuasive, not binding, only in case of doubt. Local ordinances should be translated in the vernacular, especially if it is penal in character, because there is a requirement there so as not to violate due process so that that it can be readily understood by the constituents and they cannot use it as a defense that they did not understand what was being posted with regard to the law if it is written or promulgated in English. If promulgated both in English and Spanish language, English prevails. Title may resolve doubts as to its proper construction by extending or restraining its purview or by correcting an obvious error. In case of doubt, resort may be had to the title to determine legislative intent because it normally indicates it. Limitation, not controlling, if the body of the statute is free from ambiguity, no resort to the title. Need not be an index of contents of the law but it carries weight because of the one title, one subject matter rule. 1. It serves as aid in case of doubt in its language, to its construction and ascertaining legislative will. 2. Used by the court to clear the obscurity. 3. An aid when there is doubt as to the meaning of the law. When the text of the statute is clear and free from doubt, it is improper to resort to its title to make it obscure. Bo versus Kamalek, General Register No. 221697, March 8, 2016. Chapter, Article and Section Headings Head Notes or Epigraphs, Convenient Index to the Content of its Provisions A. In case of doubt or ambiguity in the meaning of their law or the intention of the legislature, they may be consulted in aid or interpretation. B. They are not part of the law thus, they can never control the plain terms of the enacting clauses. c. When the text of the statute is clear and unambiguous, there is neither necessity nor propriety to resort to headings and epigraphs for the interpretations of the text. d. These secondary aids may be consulted to remove, but not to create, doubt nor to limit or control the plain language of the law. Marginal Notes Marginal notes and headings summarize the effect of sections of an act where the wording of either marginal notes or headings seem to have a contradictory meaning to the wording of the main body of an act, the wording of the main body of an act should be followed. Marginal notes and headings are inserted when act goes for printing during its progress through Parliament, so are a little unreliable as an indication of Parliament's will. Notes written in a margin, usually handwritten and initialed. Marginal notes, limitation, resorted to only when such notes were in fact inserted under the authority of the legislature, needs approval from Congress. Preamble Introductory explanation. Not an essential part of the statute. May explain ambiguities but not conclusive or controlling. Preamble, purpose, the key to the statute to open the minds of the makers as to the mischiefs to be remedied and objectives to be accomplished by the provision of the statute. 1. That part of the statute written immediately after its title, which states the purpose, reason or justification for the enactment of the law. 2. Expressed in the whereas clause. 3. Usually omitted in statutes made by the Congress. In its place, these an aid in legislative bodies use the explanatory note to explain the reasons for the enactment of statutes. 4. Not an essential part of a statute. a. Thus, where the meaning of a statute is clear and unambiguous, the preamble can neither expand nor restrict its operation, much less prevail over its text. b. It cannot be used as basis for giving a statute a meaning not apparent on its face. 5. It may clarify ambiguities, thus it is the key of the statute. 6. It may express the legislative to make the law apply retroactively, 
in which case the law has to be given retroactive effect, so as to carry out such intent, PNBV Office of the President. Legislative Definitions and Interpretative Clauses Such definition or construction should be followed by the courts. Statutory definition supersedes the commonly accepted or a previous judicial definition. 7. Extrinsic Aids in Construction Extrinsic Aids, Defined these are existing aids from outside sources, meaning outside of the four corners of the statute. If there is any doubt as to the meaning of the statute, the interpreter must first find that out within the statute. Extrinsic aids therefore are resorted to after exhausting all the available intrinsic aids and still there remain some ambiguity in the statute. Extrinsic aids resorted to by the courts are history of the enactment of the statute opinions and rulings of officials of the government called upon to execute or implement administrative laws, contemporaneous construction by executive officers, actual proceedings of the legislative body, individual statements by members of Congress, and the author of the law. Other sources of extrinsic aids can be the reports and recommendations of legislative committees, public policy, judicial construction, and construction by the bar. Extrinsic aids, where found. Extraneous facts and circumstances outside the printed page of the statute. Extrinsic aids, enumerated. History or realities existing at the time of the passage of the law. Legislative proceedings. Changes in phraseology. Prior laws and rejudicial decisions. Contemporaneous and construction. Consequences of alternative interpretations. Objects. Purpose. Expediency. Occasion and necessity. Remedy provided. Conditions of the country to be affected. And other extrinsic matters. Resort to extrinsic aids, when. Extrinsic aids are resorted to after exhausting all the available intrinsic aids and still there remain some ambiguity in the statute. If all the intrinsic aids have been availed, exhausted and the ambiguity remains. Extrinsic aids resorted to by the courts are a. History of the enactment of the statute. b. Opinions and rulings of officials of the government called upon to execute or implement administrative laws. c. Contemporaneous construction by executive officers charged with implementing and enforcing the provisions of the statutes and less. Such interpretation is clearly erroneous. d. Actual proceedings of the legislative body. e. Individual statements by members of Congress, and f. The author of the law. Other sources of extrinsic aids are contemporaneous circumstances. Courts may resort to contemporaneous construction or that put upon it at the time of its passage or soon afterwards and universally acquiesced in and acted upon. Facts and circumstances existing at the time of, and leading to the enactment of the statute such as History of the times Contemporaneous customs The state of the existing law Evils to be remedied Remedy provided Example Riding in tandem ordinance wherein if you are looking from the outside you can never understand the sense of banning two people riding in a motorcycle, unless you know the contemporaneous circumstance that led to the enactment of that particular enactment. Contemporary Construction Definition These are construction placed upon statutes at the time of, or after, their enactment by the executive legislature or judicial authorities, as well as those who, because of their involvement in the process of legislation, are knowledgeable of the intent and purpose of the law. Contemporanea Expositionist Optima et Fortissimo in Ledge, the contemporary construction is strongest in law. Contemporaneous construction, degree as aid. Contemporaneous construction is the construction placed upon the statute by an executive administrative officer called upon to execute or administer such statute. Legislative History 
It is a well-settled rule of statutory construction that where a statute is susceptible of several interpretations where there is ambiguity in its language, there is no better means of ascertaining the will and intention of the legislature than that which is afforded by the history of the statute. Generally speaking, the history of a statute refers to all its antecedents from its inception until its enactment into law. Its history proper covers the period and the steps done from the time the bill is introduced until it is finally passed by the legislature. Where a statute is susceptible of several interpretations, or where there is ambiguity in its language, there is no better means of ascertaining the will and intention of the legislature than that which is afforded by the history of the statute. Legislative History Scope covers introduction of the bill in the legislature up to its final passage. Legislative history, what it includes. President's message. Explanatory note accompanying the bill. Committee reports of the legislative investigations and public hearings of the subject of the bill. Sponsorship speech. Debates and deliberations. Amendments and changes in phraseology. What constitutes legislative history? All antecedents from the statute's inception until its enactment into law. A. Includes the President's message if bill was enacted in response thereto. B. Explanatory note accompanying the bill. C. Committee reports of legislative investigations. D. Public hearings on the subject of the bill. E. Sponsorship speech. F. Debates and deliberations concerning the bill. G. Amendments and changes in phraseology it has undergone before final approval. B. If statute is a revision of prior statute, the latter's practical application and rejudicial construction amendments it underwent and contemporary events during the time of its enactment shall form part of its legislative history. C. Foreign statute, history includes. 1. History of Anglo-American precedents or other foreign sources. 2. Their practical application and the decision of the courts construing and applying such precedents in the country of origin. Illustrative case, Ejacito v. Kamalek, General Register No. 212398, November 25, 2014. The SC traced back at least three laws prior to the enactment of that one particular law which disqualified D. R. E. Jacito as elected governor of Lugana. The main question there was, if you are a main contributed to the campaign funds for a particular candidate, is your contribution part of the computation to determine if the particular candidate overspent his expenses in the elections? And of course, the SC, there was no ambiguity. It was only contested by Ejacito, said that consistent in the three laws, in computing for campaign expenses donations from third-party donors are included to check if the candidate has overspent or underspent. President's Message to Legislature 1. President's Address, State of the Nation Address, addressed to the Congress at the opening of the regular session, contains a. Proposed Legislative Measures B. Indicates the President's thinking on the proposed legislation, which when enacted into law, follows his line of thinking. State of the Nation Address where President proposes legislative measures. Indicates his line of thinking on the matter. Thus, courts may refer to the message of the President to determine legislative intent because the statute was passed in response to the President's message. Explanatory Note a short exposition of explanation accompanying a proposed legislation by its author or proponent. Contains. A. Statement of the reason or purpose of the bill. B. Arguments advanced by its author in urging its passage. A short explanation accompanying a proposed legislation by its author. Where there is ambiguity in a statute or where a statute is susceptible of more than one interpretation courts may resort to the explanatory note to clarify the ambiguity and ascertain the purpose or intent of the statute. Note. a. The explanatory not be used as basis for giving a statute a meaning that is inconsistent with what is expressed in the text of the statute. b. 
explanatory note is only resorted to only for clarification in case of doubt, and not where there is no ambiguity in the law. See, this is a mere expression of author's views and reasons for the proposed legislation and may not accordingly override the clear intent as expressed in the statute. Explanatory note, contents. Reason or purpose of the bill. Arguments advanced by the author. Reports and recommendation of legislative committees. Lucrative source of information helpful in construction provided, they are recorded in the journal. Limitation, committee reports are not controlling, may not be considered to clear an ambiguity. Reports of commissions. 1. Commissions, are usually formed to compile or collate all laws on a particular subject and to prepare the draft of the proposed code. 2. Special commissions were created to draft the text of the revised penal code and civil code. Legislative debates, views and deliberations. Useful in interpretation provided they show common agreement among the members of the legislature as to the meaning of an ambiguous provision. Look into the end result, find out what the intent. Legislative debates, limitation. Not safe guides to ascertain the meaning and purpose of the law. They express only the views and opinions of the individual members of the legislature and do not necessarily reflect the view of Congress as a whole. Courts may avail themselves of the actual proceedings of the legislative body to assist in determining the construction of a statute of doubtful meaning. They may resort to the legislative deliberation in the legislature on a bill which eventually was enacted into law to ascertain the meaning of its provisions. Thus, where there is doubt as to what provision of a statute means, that meaning which was put to the provision during the legislative deliberation or discussion on the bill may be adopted. Legislative debate may be resorted to when there is doubt as to what a provision of a statute means. However, the views expressed by the legislators during deliberations of a bill as to the bill's purpose are not controlling in the interpretation of the law. The opinion and views expressed by the legislators during floor deliberations of a bill may not be given weight at all in any of the following instances. A where the circumstances indicating meaning of a statute other than that expressed by the legislators. b. Where the views expressed were conflicting. c. Where the intent deducible from such views is not clear. d. Where the statute involved is free from ambiguity. Where two or more statutes relating to the same subject matter were enacted by different assemblies, neither is qualified to speak about the intent of the other. Illustrative case, Bo v. Kumalek, General Register No. 221697, March 8, 2016. Public Policy. Policy which induced its enactment or which was designed to be promoted is a proper subject for consideration. Adopted Statues. The general rule is that where local statues are patterned after or copied from those of another country. The decision of the courts in such country construing those laws are entitled to great weight in the interpretation of such local statutes and will be generally followed if found reasonable and in harmony with justice, public policy and other local statutes on the subject. Example of such statutes Rule An amendment of a statute indicates a change in meaning from that which the statute originally had. A. Corporation law B tax code. C. Labor laws. D. Naturalization law. E. Rules of court. Limitations of the rule. Whether local law and the foreign statute from which the former was patterned differ in some material aspects. Foreign construction is clearly erroneous or has not become settled. Where the adopting state has given the statute its own interpretation. Construction by executive officers. Executive construction, is the construction by an executive or administrative officer directly called to implement the law. The opinions and rulings of officials of the government called upon to execute or implement administrative laws command much respect and weight. An interpretation embodied in a circular, directive or regulation is an expressed interpretation. Construction by executive officers, forms. 
executive and administrative officers are generally the very first official to interpret the law. These interpretations are in the form of 1. Rules and regulations 2. Circulars 3. Directives 4. Opinions and rulings Executive construction, kinds 1. Construction by an executive or administrative officer directly called to implement law which may be a. Expressed, x. Interpretation embodied in circulars, directive or regulation. b. Implied, a practice of enforcement of not applying the statute to certain citations. 2. Construction by the Secretary of Justice in his capacity as the chief legal advisor of the government in the form of opinions. In the absence of the ruling of a president, the opinions of Secretary of Justice is controlling among administrative and executive officials. 3. Interpretation handed down in and adversely proceeding in the form of a ruling by an executive office exercising quasi-judicial power. Note, in the absence of error or abuse of power or lack of jurisdiction or grave abuse of discretion clearly conflicting with either the letter or the spirit of a legislative enactment creating or changing a governmental agency, the action of the agency would not be disturbed by the courts. Reason why contemporaneous construction is given much weight, it comes from the particular branch of government called upon to implement the law thus construed. These same people are the drafters of the law they interpret. When to disregard contemporaneous construction, CC is not binding upon the court, the court may disregard it. 1. Where there is no ambiguity in the law. 2. Where the construction is clearly erroneous. 3. Where strong reason to the contrary exists. 4. Where the court has previously given the statute a different interpretation. If there is an error in implementation of the law, such error may be corrected. The doctrine of estoppel does not apply. As a rule, erroneous contemporaneous construction creates no vested right on the part of those who relied and followed such construction. But this rule is not absolute. There may be exceptions in the interest of justice and fair play, x. Tax cases. Construction of executive officers, value. Considered and given weight if uniform, consistent, observed and acted on for long period of time. Opinions and rulings of officials tasked to enforce administrative laws command much respect and weight. The duty to enforce the law, which devolves upon the executive branch of the government necessarily calls for the interpretation of its ambiguous provisions. Thus, Executive and administrative officers are generally the first officials to interpret the law, preparatory to its enforcement and such interpretation comes in the form of rules and regulations, circulars, directives, opinions and rulings. Executive Construction, Kinds Construction by an executive or administrative officer directly called to implement the law may be expressed or implied. Example of expressed or implied. Example of expressed construction, circular, directive or regulation. Example of implied construction, non-enforcement in certain situations, or applying it in a particular manner. It is interpretation by usage or practice. Construction by the Secretary of Justice. In his or her capacity as Chief Legal Advisor. Executive construction kinds. Construction by the Secretary of Justice it is in the form of opinions issued upon request of administrative or executive officials who enforce the law. Construction by an executive officer exercising quasi-judicial power it is in the form of a ruling in an adversary proceeding. Legislative construction. Legislative interpretation. The legislature may provide an interpretation or declaration clause in a statute but they cannot limit or restrict the power granted to courts. 1. While legislative interpretation is not controlling, courts may resort to it to clarify ambiguity in the language. 2. Such legislative interpretation is entitled of respect especially if the executive department has similarly construed the statute. Legislative construction, 
form. Indicated by the language of the later enactments. May be considered, but not controlling. Judicial construction. A. The power and duty to interpret or construe a statute or the constitution belongs to the judiciary. B. Supreme Court construes the applicable law and controversies which are ripe for judicial resolution. C. Moot and academic cases cases wherein. 1. Purpose has become stale. 2. Where no practical relief can be granted. 3. Which have no practical effect. D. The court may nonetheless resolve a moot case where public interest requires its resolution. E. Laws are not interpreted in a vacuum, they are always decided based on facts. Thus, laws are interpreted always in the context of the peculiar factual situation of each case. The circumstances of time, place, event, person and particularly attendant circumstances should be taken in their totality so that justice can be rationally and fairly dispensed. Philippines Today Incorporated VNLRC Judicial Construction A judicial decision interpreting a statute is considered in construing similar subsequent statutes. Doctrine of Stare Decisis 1. Stare Decisis et non quieta movia, one should follow past precedents and should not disturb what has been settled. Reason for such doctrine, the Supreme Court has a duty not only of interpreting and applying the law but also in protecting the society from needless upheavals. Interest publici at sit finis litium, interest of then state demands that there be an end to litigation. 2. A ruling in order to come within the doctrine of stare decision must be categorically stated in the issue expressly raised by the parties, must be a direct ruling. 3. Rulings that are merely subsilencio are merely a bite dictum. 4. This doctrine is not absolute because Supreme Court may change or abandon a precedent enunciated by it. Doctrine of stare decisis et non quieta movia. One should follow precedents and should not disturb what has been settled. Doctrine of stare decisis, when applied. The ruling must be categorically stated on an issue expressly raised by the parties on an issue expressly raised by the parties. Must be a direct ruling on substantially the same facts. A bite of dictum. An opinion of the court upon some question of law which is not necessary to the decision of the case before it, not binding. A bite dictum or a bite dicta. Other things said. A passing comment. An observation made by a judge incidental to the case being tried. While authoritative, is not binding on future courts under the doctrine of stare decisis. An opinion expressed by the court upon some question of law which is not necessary to the decision of the case before it. It is not binding as a precedent. Ratio decidendi or rationis decidendi. The reasons for the decision. Principles used by a judge when deciding. Ratio decidendi or ratio decidendi. The principles create a binding precedent. Courts will have to follow the same decision if a case with similar facts is presented a bite dictum and ratio decidendi, distinguished. Ratio decidendi, a binding precedent. A bite dictum, a persuasive precedent. Construction by the bar. They are always received with great respect and consideration and may be resorted to for the purposes of determining the meaning of the statute. The meaning publicly given by the statute by long professional usage. Presumed to be true but not controlling. Dictionaries and textbooks. Dictionaries generally define words in their natural, plain and ordinary acceptance and significance. Where the law does not define the words used in a statute and the legislature has not intended a technical or special meaning to those words, the court may adopt the ordinary meaning of the words as defined in the dictionaries. Determine the meaning to be assigned to words of common usage or technical terms. Illustrative case, Zari v. Flores, 94 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 319, 1979. Doctrine of Implications and Inferences Doctrine of Necessary Implication and Inferences 
that which is implied in the statute is much a part of it as that which is expressed. Doctrine of Necessary Implication, Purpose It enables the court to draw inferences from legislative purpose and intent in such a way as to determine whether certain minor or specific things are covered by the general or broad terms used in the statute. Doctrine of Necessary Implication, Reason Very rarely, if at all, are statutes framed with minute particularly as to cover every conceivable situation. Doctrine of Necessary Implication, Nature of This is not judicial legislation but a method of discovery of legislative intent through the logical process of deduction. A statutory grant of power carries with it, by implication, everything necessary to carry out the power or right and make it effectual and complete. Doctrine of Necessary Implication, Limitation If it is not a part of legislative intent. Qua versus CSC 206 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 65, 1992. Illustrative Case, Qua vs. Civil Service Commission, General Registration No. 88979, February 7, 1992. Facts The Early Retirement and Voluntary Separation Law was enacted to streamline and trim down the bloated bureaucracy. Section 2 states in part. The benefits under this Act shall apply to all regular, temporary, casual, and emergency employees, regardless of age, who have rendered at least a total of two, two, consecutive years of government service as of the date of separation. Uniformed personnel of the armed forces of the Philippines including those of the PCINP are excluded from the coverage of this Act. An employee of the National Irrigation Administration NIA, applied to avail of early retirement but it was denied. Instead, she was offered separation benefits. She went to the Civil Service Commission, CSC, but it affirmed the decision of NIA. She moved to reconsider but was still denied. Contention of the CSC The employment is coterminous with a project, which is contractual in nature. As such, she is not one of those enumerated in the law, namely, regular, temporary, casual, and emergency employees. Thus, she is not governed by the law pursuant to the statutory construction principle of expression uniasist exclusion ulterioris. The objective of the separation law is not really to grant separation or retirement benefits but reorganization to streamline government functions. Contention of the employee The implementing guidelines of the early retirement law enumerates employees who are excluded from the coverage. They are experts and consultants, uniformed military and police personnel, appointed officials and employees, officials and employees who retired voluntarily prior to the law or those with pending cases punishable by mandatory separation from service. She does not belong to any of the excluded employees, hence she is included. Held. There is no substantial difference between contractual, casual and emergency employees. A coterminous employee is non-career civil servant, just like casual and emergency employees. It may be argued that Congress would not have specifically enumerated that employees to be covered had not the intention been to restrict its meaning and confine its terms and benefits to the people expression uniasist exclusion ulterioris. It may also be argued that a person, object or thing omitted from an enumeration must be held to have been omitted intentionally. Pursuant to the principal casus omissus pro omisso hey bendesist. But it erase to these legal maxims results in incongruity and violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. The maxim expression uniasist exclusion ulterioris does not apply, but the doctrine of necessary implication. It says every statute is understood, by implication, to contain all such provisions as may be necessary to effectuate its object and purpose, or to make effective rights, powers, privileges or jurisdiction which it grants, including all such collateral and subsidiary consequences as may be fairly and logically inferred from its terms.
the denial of the application is unreasonable, unjustified and oppressive. The application should be granted in the interest of substantial justice. After all, the employee served form almost 15 years. Kovi Province of Cebu, General Register No. 141386, November 29, 2001. Illustrative Case, Co vs. Province of Cebu, General Registration No. 141386, November 29, 2001. Facts the governor of Cebu appointed teachers who have no item in that bed plantula to handle extension classes to accommodate students in public schools. The salaries and personnel related benefits of these teachers were charged against the Special Education Fund, SEF. Also charged against the CEFAR scholarship grants of the province. The CO suspended the disbursement because salaries and grants are not chargeable against the CEF. Contention of Co. Section 100C2 of the Local Government Code provides The annual school board budget shall give priority to the following Establishment and maintenance of extension classes where necessary The legal maxim expressio uniasist exclusion ulterior supplies since salaries, personnel-related benefits and scholarship grants are not among those authorized as lawful expenditures of the CEF under the local government code, they should be deemed excluded. Held. The contention of CO is without merit. It is an elementary rule in statutory construction that legislative intent controls interpretation of a statute. Under the doctrine of necessary implication, the authority to open extension classes chargeable against the CEF logically includes hiring of teachers and payment of their salaries and other benefits, even if hiring and payment were not specifically mentioned in the law. The service and salaries of these teachers are necessary and indispensable to establish and maintain extension classes. Every statute is understood, by implication, to contain all such provisions as may be necessary to effectuate its object and purpose, or to make effective rights, powers, privileges or jurisdiction which it grants, including all such collateral and subsidiary consequences as may be fairly and logically inferred from its terms. But a scholarship grant is neither necessary nor indispensable to the operation and maintenance of public schools. Hence, the doctrine of necessary implication does not apply to it. Restrictions on the doctrine. Presumptions in aid of construction. The courts may properly rely on presumptions as to legislative intent to resolve doubts as to its correct interpretation. Presumptions, basis. Logic, experience and common sense. Presumptions, when applied. When there is doubt as to legislative intent and such doubt should be resolved in favor of that construction which is in accord with the presumption on the matter. Presumptions, examples. Congress acted within the scope of its authority. Against violation of international law. Against extraterritorial operation of statutes. Against unconstitutionality. Against extraterritorial operation of statutes against unconstitutionality, against inconsistency, injustice, motive of Congress, in favor of beneficial operation of statutes, against inconvenience, absurdity, and ineffectiveness of statutes, as to public policy, against irrepealable laws, repeal, unnecessary changes in the laws, implied repeals, Acquiescence to judicial construction. As to existing laws. As to jurisdiction of courts. Finals. 8. Amendment, revision, codification and repeal. Amendment, defined. Change or modification by addition, deletion or alteration of a statute which survives in its amended form. 
if transparent, construction is dispensed with. Amendment, who is authority? The legislature, legislative power to enact includes the power to amend or appeal subject to constitutional requirements or existing law. Amendment, scope. It extends to statute in the nature of contracts. Example, legislative franchises to establish and operate utilities, which may be unilaterally amended by the legislature without impairing the obligations of contract, because it normally provides that it is subject to amendment or repeal by Congress. When common good requires amendment, how affected by enactment of an amendatory act modifying or altering some provisions of the statute with error expressly or impliedly. Express amendment. Specific sections or provisions sought to be amended. Example, a provision sought to be amended is quoted, followed by is hereby amended read as follows. Implied amendment. Does not specify sections or provisions but provides for a general phrase. Implied amendment, example of any provision of law which is inconsistent therewith is modified accordingly. But the absence of such provision does not mean that the subsequent law may no longer amend a prior act on the same subject. It still amends, if there is a reconcilable repugnancy between them. But implied amendment is neither presumed nor favored. Every statute should be harmonized with other laws on the same subject. Amendment, when effective. Fifteen days following its publication of the OG or a newspaper of general circulation, unless another date is specified after publication. Amendment, how construed. A statute and its amendment should be read together as a whole. The amended act is regarded as if the statute has been originally enacted in its amended form and the amendment becomes part of the original statute. Amendment, effect of. An amended act should be construed differently from the original act. It would not have been amended had the legislature did not want to change meaning. Example, if the exception is deleted, it means that it is now included in the scope of the general term. Amendment, how it operates. General rule, amendatory acts operate prospectively. Except, contrary is provided or implied. Condition. No vested rights or obligation of contracts is impaired. Amendment, effect on vested rights. Does not affect vested rights. Because it takes effect prospectively. Amendment, effect on jurisdiction. Jurisdiction over the subject matter is determined by the law in force at the time. Of commencement of action. Once acquired. It cannot be divested by amendatory act and stays until decided. Unless, express prohibitive words or words of similar import are used. It applies to quasi-judicial bodies. Erectors, Incorporated vs. NLRC, 256 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 629, 1996. Illustrative Case, Erectors, Incorporated vs. NLRC. General Register No. 104215, May 8, 1996, 256 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 629, 1996. Facts. Erectors recruited an overseas Filipino worker, OFW, to work as service contract driver in Saudi Arabia for one year with a salary of $165 and allowance of $165 a month plus $1,000 renewal bonus. But it was not implemented because the position of service driver was no longer available. Thus, they executed another one-year contract but for the position of helper-slash-laborer with a salary of $105 and allowance of $105 monthly. The OFW returned to the country and invoked his first contract, demanding for the difference in his salary and allowance plus contractual bonus for not availing of his vacation or home leave credits. But this was denied by erectors. On March 31, 1982, 
the OFW filed with the labor arbiter a complaint against directors for underpayment of wages and non-payment of overtime pay and contractual bonus. On May 1, 1982 however, while the case was still in conciliation stage, Executive Order No. 797 creating the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration POEA, took effect. It vested the POEA with exclusive and original jurisdiction over all cases, including money claims, involving employer-employee relations arising out of or by virtue of any law or contract involving Filipino workers for overseas employment. Despite Executive Order 797, the Labor Arbiter heard the case and decided in favor of the OFW. Erectors appealed to the NLRC but was denied, hence this petition for special civil action for certiorari. Contention of Erectors, Executive Order 797 divested the Labor Arbiter of jurisdiction over cases arising from overseas employment contract. It applies retroactively to effect pending cases pursuant to the ruling in Briad Agro Development Corp. v. Delusina. Held, Executive Order 797 did not divest the labor arbiter with jurisdiction claims arising from overseas employment contract. Jurisdiction over the subject matter is determined by the law at the time of the commencement of the action. Prior to the efficacy of Executive Order 797, the laws in force were Presidential Decree Numbers 1691 and 1391 which vested the Labor Arbiter with original and exclusive jurisdiction over these cases. Laws should be applied prospectively unless the legislative intent to give them retroactive effect is expressly declared or is necessarily implied from the language used. The reliance on the ruling in Briad Agro Development Corp. v. Delusner is misplaced. In that case, Executive Order 111 amended Article 217 of the Labor Code to widen the workers' access to the government for redress of grievances by giving the regional directors and labor arbiters concurrent jurisdiction over money claims. This amendment however created a situation where their jurisdiction overlapped. As a remedy, Republic Act 6715 delineated their respective jurisdiction. As such, Executive Order 111 and Republic Act 6715 are curative statutes which retroactive application is an exception to the general rule on prospective application of laws. Curative statutes are enacted to cure defects in a prior law or to validate legal proceedings, instruments or acts of public authorities which would otherwise be void for want of conformity with certain existing legal requirements. Executive Order 797 is not a curative statute. It was not intended to remedy any defect in the law. It should thus be applied prospectively and should not affect jurisdiction over cases filed prior to its efficacy. Erectors Incorporated vs. NLRC Facts, a money claim arising out of Overseas Employment Contract, OEC, was filed by an overseas Filipino worker with the labor arbiter. During pendency of the case however, a law was passed transferring jurisdiction over money claims arising out of OEC from the labor arbiter to the POEA. Held, jurisdiction is determined by the law at the time of commencement of action. Once acquired, court proceeds to hear and decide. It is not divested by subsequent amendatory act unless it expressly provides or is curative statute which may be given retroactive effect. Effect of nullity of prior or amendatory act. If the prior act is declared invalid, the amendatory act is also invalid. If the amendatory act is invalid, the prior act stays. Revision, defined. Intends to re-examine the whole law, or of certain provisions which have overall implications for the entire law. Amendment and revision, distinguished. Amendment alters one or a few specific and separable provisions whereas revision overhauls the entire law. Codification, defined. Enactment of various laws on the same subject matter into a single, comprehensive statute. 
it is to be considered as such and not as a series of disconnected articles or provisions. Revision and Codification Purpose To restate into one statute Similar subject found in various laws Simplify complicated provisions And make them accessible and easily found Revision and Codification Effects Insertion of new provisions does not alter the construction of previous acts unless otherwise clearly intended. Omission of old provisions, deemed repealed, unless the statute or code provides, expressly or impliedly. But, the repeal by revision or codification of former laws is possible only if the revised statute or code was intended to cover and perfect system itself. When both intent and scope clearly evince the idea of repeal, all omitted parts are deemed repealed. Mekena v. Commission on Audit, 216 Service e Members Civil Relief Act 500, 1992. Illustrative case, Mekena v. Commission on Audit, 216 Service e Members Civil Relief Act 500, 1992. Facts. An NBI director was confined for cholecystitis which caused him hospital and medical expenses that he wants to be reimbursed. He based his claim on section 699 of the revised administrative code, RAC, of 1917 which affords civil servants allowances in case of injury, death, or sickness incurred in the performance of duty but it was denied by the Commission on Audit, Co. Contention of Co. Section 699 of the RAC was omitted in the Administrative Code of 1987 hence deemed repealed. Contention of Co. Allowing Section 699 to remain in force argues against the Administrative Code of 1987 itself which whereas clause says. The effectiveness of the government will be enhanced by a new Administrative Code which incorporate in a unified document the major structural functional and procedural principles and rules of governance. In effect, what is contemplated is only one code, the Administrative Code of 1987. Held, Section 699 of the Revised Administrative Code of 1987. Held, the repealing clause of the Administrative Code of 1987 says, All laws, decrees, orders, rules and regulations, or portions thereof, inconsistent with this code are hereby repealed or modified accordingly. Since it did not specify the title or number of the law sought to be repealed, which has two categories. One is where the provisions of the two laws on the same subject matter are irreconcilable. The other is where the enactment of a statute revising or codifying the former laws on the whole subject matter. But the second category is possible only if the revised statute or code was intended to cover the whole subject to be a complete and perfect system in itself. It revises the whole subject matter of the statute. Both intent and scope evince the idea of repeal. It is clear intent of the legislature to substitute the prior act. The Administrative Code of 1987 does not fall under this category because the intent is clear that it covers the aspects of administration organization and procedure only. It also does not fall under the first category because there is no irreconcilable conflict between the provisions of both laws. Lastly, implied repeal is not favored. The presumption is against repugnancy or inconsistency because the legislature is presumed to know the existing laws on the subject and not to have enacted inconsistent or conflicting statutes. Thus, even if section 699 of the revised Administrative Code of 1917 was omitted in the Administrative Code of 1987, it remains in force in the absence of irreconcilable inconsistency apart from the fact that it was not specifically identified for repeal. Mekena v. Co. Facts, a claim for reimbursement was denied because the provision of law it invoked was omitted in the subsequent law. Held, mere omission of a provision in the subsequent law does not result in amendment or repeal unless it expressly provided. 
Otherwise, it is deemed an implied repeal which may either be due to irreconcilable differences between the prior and subsequent law or the enactment of a subsequent law revising or codifying the old laws is intended to cover the whole subject to be a complete and perfect system in itself. Change in Phraseology Change in phraseology, mere change in phraseology does not imply that the lawmakers intended to change the construction of the old laws. General Rule Neither change in phraseology nor omission or addition of words alters the construction of former acts. Except, if intent to change the construction is very clear, especially if the change or omission is material as to indicate intent to depart from the previous construction of the old laws. Rearrangement of sections. Rearrangement of sections does not change the operation effect or meaning of statute unless changes are of such nature as to clearly manifest legislative intent to change old laws. Repeal, defined. Recalling, revoking or abrogation of a statute by another. Repeal, who is authority? The legislature, subject to constitutional limitations. Section 1, Article V, The Legislative Department, 1987 Constitution. The legislative power shall be vested in the Congress of the Philippines which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives, except to the extent reserved to the people by the provision on initiative and referendum. Constitutional prohibition against passage of irrepealable laws. Except to the extent reserved to the people by the provision on initiative and referendum. Non-delegability of legislative power. Prohibition against enactment of irrepealable laws. They are not found in the text of the Constitution because they are mere corollaries in the nature of implied substantive limitations. City of Davao v. RTC, General Registration No. 127383, August 18, 2005. Illustrative Case, City of Davao v. RTC. General Register No. 127383, August 18, 2005. First, that Section 33 of Presidential Decree 1146 be expressly and categorically repealed by law. Second, that a provision be enacted to substitute the declared policy of exemption from any and all taxes as an essential factor for the solvency of the GSIS Fund. These requisites for repeal have not been satisfied by the LGC. Contention of the Local Government Unit The exemption granted to GSIS under Section 33 of Presidential Decree 1146 was effectively withdrawn upon the enactment of the LGC which further says that special laws like Presidential Decree 1146 which are inconsistent with it are repealed or modified accordingly. Held, concededly, the second condition prescribed by Section 33 of Presidential Decree 1146 does not appear to be met as no provision is found in the Local Government Code of 1991 that substitutes the declared policy of exemption from any and all taxes as an essential factor for the solvency of the fund. But the amendatory second paragraph in Section 33 introduced by Presidential Decree 1981 is fundamentally flawed. This unorthodox condition effectively imposes restrictions on the competency of Congress to enact future legislature on the taxability of GSIS. This places undue restraint on the plenary power of Congress to amend or repeal laws in violation of the prohibition against the passage of irrepealable laws. Irrepealable laws are prohibited because they deprive succeeding legislatures of the fundamental best senses carte blanche in crafting laws. Renato S. Pano once said, to be sure, there are no irrepealable laws just as there are no irrepealable constitutions. Change is the predicate of progress and we should not fear change. It may be argued that Section 33 does not preclude repeal of tax-exempt status of the GSIS but merely imposes conditions for its validity. But if these conditions are honored, they have the precise effect of limiting the power of Congress. Thus, the same rationale for prohibiting irrepealable laws applies in prohibiting restraints on future amendatory laws. 
The present legislature cannot bind future legislature to particular mode of repeal. It cannot declare in advance the intent of subsequent legislatures. City of Davao vs. RTC Facts Xice refused any real property taxes to the local government unit because of a prior exempting law setting two conditions for repeal which were not met by the subsequent law. Held, the conditions set by the prior law place undue restraint on the plenary power of Congress to amend or repeal laws in violation of the prohibition against passage of irrepealable laws. The present legislature cannot bind future legislature to a particular mode of repeal. It cannot declare in advance the intent of future legislatures. Repeal, kinds of. Repeal, kinds of. Total, revokes the statute completely. Partial, leaves unaffected portions in force. Express, declaration in a repealing clause that a particular and specific law is sought to be repealed, by identifying the number or title. Implied, all other repeals are deemed implied repeals. Failure to add the repealing clause indicated that there is not intent to repeal any existing law. Unless there is a reconcilable inconsistency. In which case it is deemed an implied repeal. Repeal, kinds of. Even if there is a repealing clause but if fails to identify or specify the law sought to be repealed, it is still an implied repeal. Example, all laws or parts thereof which are inconsistent with this act are hereby repealed or modified accordingly. The intent is not to repeal any existing law on the matter, unless there is a reconcilable inconsistency. Laws are repealed only by the enactment of subsequent laws, not by violation, non-observance, disuse of customs and contrary practice. Repeal by implication, conditions. There must be sufficient revelation of the intent to repeal, which must be very clear. Repeal by implication, categories or modes. Irreconcilable conflict between provisions of two acts. Conditions, two statutes cover the same subject matter and object. Clearly inconsistent and incompatible with each other. That they cannot be harmonized. Both cannot be given effect. That is, that one law cannot be enforced without nullifying the other. Repeal by implication, categories or modes. If the subsequent act covers the whole subject of the prior act and is clearly intended as a substitute of the same subject matter but different objects, the two laws can stand together, although they refer to the same subject matter. Illustrative Cases Eggjators vs. CA 261 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 17, 1996 Facts The members of the Provincial Board of Canvassers were convicted of the election offence under Section 231 of the Omnibus Election Code, OEC. This after they proclaimed the losing candidate as 8th elected board member. Contention of the Canvassers the election offence for which they were convicted is repealed by Republic Act 6646 and Republic Act 7166 which amended the OEC by deleting or adding certain provisions. Paragraph 2, Section 231 of the OEC states. The respective board of canvassers shall prepare a certificate of canvassers shall prepare a certificate of canvas duly signed and affixed with the imprint of the thumb of the right hand of each member, supported by a statement of the votes and received by each candidate in each polling place and, on the basis thereof, shall proclaim as elected the candidates who obtain the highest number of votes cast in the province, city municipality or barangay. Failure to comply with this requirement shall constitute an election offence. This was modified by Section 28 of Republic Act 7166 by removing the specific mand by which the winning candidates are proclaimed. Thus, it repealed the second paragraph, Section 231 of the OEC under which they were convicted. Held, Section 231 was not expressly repealed by the amending and repealing clause of Republic Act 7166 which says. Section 39. 
Amending and Repealing Clause. Sections 107, 108 and 245 of the Omnibus Election Code are hereby repealed. Likewise, the inclusion in Section 262 of the Omnibus Election Code of the violations of Sections 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111 and 112 as among election offences is also hereby repealed. This repeal shall have retroactive effect. Neither is the implied repeal. While Section 231 of the OEC and Section 28 of Republic Act 7166 pertains to the canvassing by the Board of Canvassers, this fact alone is not sufficient to cause an implied repeal. While the two provisions differ in terms, neither is this fact sufficient to cause repugnance. In order to effect implied repeal, the two statutes must be so irreconcilably repugnant and inconsistent with each other. The following standard of irreconcilability resulting in implied repeal must be satisfied. 1. Both laws deal with the same subject matter. 2. The latter law must be inconsistent with the earlier law. 3. Repugnancy is clear and convincing in character. 4. The language used in the latter must be such that as to render it irreconcilable with the prior law. An inconsistency that fully short of this standard does not suffice because implied repeal is not favored. The presumption is against inconsistency and accordingly, against implied repeal because Congress is presumed to know the existing laws on the same subject and not to enact inconsistent statutes. Haggad v. Scozo Dadol, 251 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 241, 1995 Facts, criminal and administrative complaint were filed against Mayor Alfredo Wano and other members of the Sanguniang Panglangsad, SP, with the Office of the Deputy Ombudsman for the Visayas for violation of the revised Penal Code and Republic Act 6713. The complainants moved to preventively suspend Mayor Wano and other respondents. Mayor Wano opposed the motion and moved to dismiss the complaint. Contention of Mayor Wano and other respondents. The Deputy Ombudsman is without jurisdiction to try, hear and decide the administrative complaint. They argue that under Section 63 of the Local Government Code of 1991, LGC, the power to investigate and impose administrative sanctions, including preventive suspension against local officials, is now vested with the Office of the President, OP. Under Sections 61 and 63 of the LGC, the OP, not the Office of the Ombudsman, has jurisdiction over administrative complaints against any elective official of a province, highly urbanized city or independent component city. Contention of Complainants The LGC could not have repealed, abrogated or otherwise modified the pertinent provisions of the power to investigate cases against elective local officials. The power of the Ombudsman to investigate local officials under the Ombudsman Act is unaffected by the provisions of LGC. But the Deputy Ombudsman denied the motion to dismiss and even placed Mayor Wano and other respondents under preventive suspension. Mayor Wano and other respondents petitioned to prohibit and restrain the Deputy Ombudsman before the Regional Trial Court of Mandé City which granted it. The respondent judge applied the rule of statutory construction that endeavor to harmonize two laws to make each effective. Since the investigatory power of the Ombudsman Act is general, broad and vague as opposed to the LGC which provides for well-defined and specific grounds for administrative disciplinary action, the LGC could be considered an exception to the authority and administrative power of the Ombudsman to investigate local elective officials issue, whether the authority of the Ombudsman to investigate local elective officials under the Ombudsman Act of 1989 has been divested by virtue of the subsequent enactment of the LGC of 1991. Held, the petition is meritorious. Section 21 of the Ombudsman Act says, 
Section 24 grants the Ombudsman authority to preventively suspend any officer or employee under his authority pending an investigation. Whereas Section 61A of the LGC provides a complaint against any elective official of a province, a highly urbanized city, an independent component city or component city shall be filed before the office of the president. Thus, respondent insist that conformably with section 63b, preventive suspension can only be imposed by the president if the respondent is an official of a province, highly urbanized city or an independent component city. Contention of the Solicitor General While the LGC may have conferred on the OP disciplinary authority over local elective officials, it is not exclusive. The LGC did not withdraw the power of the Ombudsman to investigate local elective officials vested by the Ombudsman Act conformable with a constitutional mandate. Indeed, the SC said, there is nothing in the LGC to indicate that it repealed, expressly or impliedly, the Ombudsman Act. The two statutes on the specific matter in question are not so inconsistent or irreconcilable. Two laws on the same subject matter, which prevails between two irreconcilably inconsistent laws, the subsequent law prevails because it is the latest expression of legislative will, and Congress is presumed to know the earlier law. Legis posterius priors contrarius abrogant, subsequent statute repeals earlier law repugnant to it. Illustrative case. David v. Kumalek, General Register No. 127116, April 8, 1997 Contention of the Commission on Elections The repealing clause of the LGC includes all laws, whether general or special, inconsistent with the provisions of the Local Government Code. David and Rillan cannot claim a term longer than three years because they were elected under the aegis of the LGC which fixed the term of three years only. Held, the legislative intent is very clear, shorten the term of office of brand gay officials to three years only. First, the LGC was enacted later than Republic Act 6679. Section 43 Copyright of the LGC fixed the term of office of brand gay officials at three years whereas Section 1 of Republic Act 6679 fixes it at five years. Both laws refer to brand gay officials elected on the second Monday of May 1994. The being irreconcilable inconsistency between the two laws, implied repeal applies. While it is true that Republic Act 6679 is a special law and should prevail pursuant to the doctrine of generalia specialibus non derogant, the LGC is not necessarily a general law. The LGC is a codified set of laws that specifically applies to local government units. Section 43C specifically fixes the term of office of elective barangay officials at three years a special provision that applies only to those elected on the second Monday of May 1994. The Constitution did not expressly prohibit Congress from fixing any term of office for Barab gay officials. It merely left the determination of such term to the full discretion of the lawmaking body in accordance with the exigencies of public service. To strike down a law as unconstitutional, there must be a clear and unequivocal showing that what the Constitution prohibits, the statute permits. They miserably fail to discharge this burden to show clearly the unconstitutionality they aver. McKenna v. Co. David v. Kumalek, General Registration No. 127116, April 8, 1997. Two laws on same subject matter, which prevails. In case of irreconcilable conflict between two laws, the subsequent law prevails pursuant to the principal legis posterius priors contrarius abrogant. Between two irreconcilably inconsistent laws, the subsequent law prevails because it is the latest expression of legislative will, and Congress is presumed to know the earlier law. Legis posterius priors contrarius abrogant. Subsequent statute repealed earlier law repugnant to it. 
Illustrative Cases, David v. Kamalek, General Registration No. 127116, April 8, 1997. Ligu Njim Gabar and Gekhezen City Chapter represented Y Bonifacio Rillan v. Kamalek, General Registration No. 128039, April 8, 1997. Statutes in Paramateria, defined. They are which refer to the same person or thing, or the same class of persons or things, which have a common purpose. Statutes in Paramateria, how determined. If court decisions point to one legislative intent, regardless of whether one is criminal and the other is civil. Statutes in paramateria, how construed. They should be read together, and in connection with each other, as if they constitute one law or one system enacted in the same spirit in furtherance of the same policy. In paramateria rule, purpose to carry out the full legislative intent by giving effect to all laws and provisions on the same subject matter. In paramaterial rule, limitation. It cannot be invoked where the language of the law is clear and unambiguous. It does not apply to private acts and is highly disfavored. General and special law, rule on repeal. General law does not repeal a prior special law on the same subject matter unless clearly intended by the legislature. Generalis specialibus non derogant. Generalia specialibus non derogant. A general law does not nullify a special law. It applies irrespective of the date of passage of the special law. If the special law is subsequent, it qualifies the general law. If the law is an earlier law, it is an exception to the terms of the general law. Repeal, general effects. It renders inoperative the prior act from the time repealing law takes effect. But it does not invalidate the poor act from the beginning. Repeal, effect on jurisdiction. Neither repeal nor expiration of law divests the court of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction to try and decide cases is determined by the law in force at the time it was filed. Effects of repeal and expiration of law, distinction. In absolute repeal, the crime is obliterated, thus the stigma of conviction is erased whereas the expiration of law does not have that effect. Once jurisdiction is acquired, it proceeds unless the repealing act says otherwise. But if the action was filed after the repealing act divesting jurisdiction and the decision is null and void. Repeal, effect on jurisdiction to try criminal cases. Same rule applies. But with added exception express prohibitive words are used or criminal law violated is repealed. Repeal, effect on actions, pending or otherwise. Defeats all actions and proceedings, including those pending and pending appeal arising out of or based on the statute. Repeal, effect on vested rights. Does not impair rights accrued prior to the repeal. Repeal, effect on contracts. Does not affect the terms of contract, nor impair the rights of parties. It applies even if the other contracting party is the government. Repeal, effect on tax laws does not preclude collection of taxes assessed prior to the repeal, unless otherwise provided. Repeal, effect on penal laws. Example, the absolute repeal of the Anti-Subversion Act entitles the accused to the dismissal of the case against him as the offence no longer exhaust and the court is deprived of jurisdiction. Reason, the legislative intent is to legalize what has been decreed as illegal. Except, if the repealing act re-enacts the statute and penalizes the same act, even if the penalty is lower. The repealing act contains a saving clause that pending cases are not affected. Repeal, effect on municipal charter. Abolishes all offices under the old charter. Thus, conversion of a municipality to a city abolishes all municipal positions unless otherwise provided. Repeal or nullity of repealing law effects. When the repealing law expressly repealing a prior law is itself repealed, the prior law is not revived unless otherwise provided. 
when the repealing law expressly repealing a prior law is declared unconstitutional, the prior law remains in force. Proviso, defined. Condition precedent. Generally introduced by the word provided. It is a clause on a preceding enactment to restrain or modify the enacting clause, or of accepting something from its operation which otherwise would have been without it, or of excluding some possible ground of misinterpretation of it, as by extending it to cases not intended by the legislature to be brought within its purview. Proviso, function. To create a condition precedent, to exempt, limit, restrict or qualify a statute in whole or in part. To limit the application of the law, and not to enlarge its operation. Exception, defined. Enumeration of what should not be covered by the general rule. Exception and proviso, distinguished. Exceptions exempts while proviso sets conditions. Exceptions, how construed. Strictly, especially where the statute promotes public welfare. Saving clause, defined. A clause which exempts special things out of the general things mentioned in the law. Saving clause, purpose. To preserve something, as existing rights or causes of action or pending proceedings, from immediate interference by operation of a statute. Saving clause, limitation. Inoperative if entirely inconsistent with the purview of the law. Nine. Construction of Constitution. Constitution, defined. It is a written instrument where fundamental powers of the government are established, limited and defined, distributed among several departments for their safe and useful exercise for the benefit of the body politic. Constitutional construction, primary purpose. To determine the intent of the framers as expressed in the languages to assure its realization. Constitutional construction, applicability of rules of statutory construction. Examples of applicable rules of statutory construction. Verbal legis or the plain meaning rule. Ratio legis is stanima or words are interpreted according to the intent. At magis valit perit or the constitution is to be interpreted as a whole. Constitution, how construed. As a whole. No provision is to be separated from all the others. What if there are conflicting provisions? They should be harmonized. Liberally or strictly? Liberally, to accomplish its high objectives and carry out general principles of government. Is there an exception to liberal construction? Yes where it grants governmental powers in derogation of the inherent and natural rights of the people. So, can we say it may be construed either way? Yes, since constitutional construction is a question of intention. Should we construe the constitution according to the prevailing circumstances? No, it should be construed uniformly. It should not change together with the fluctuations of public sentiment. Amendments to constitution, how construed? They should be harmonized with the existing provisions. What if they cannot harmonized, which prevails? the existing provisions or the amendment. The amendment prevails. Language of constitution, how construed. They should be construed in their common use and ordinary meaning. Except, when technical terms are used. Why are they construed in their ordinary meaning? The constitution is not primarily a lawyer's document. It is the expression of the sovereign will of the people. Illustrative Provision. Section 7, Article 13 of the Constitution says, The state shall protect the rights of subsistence fishermen, especially of local communities, to the preferential use of the communal marine and fishing resources, both inland and offshore. How do you construe the phrase subsistence fishermen? It should be construed in its ordinary meaning. Which is, it refers to those whose catch yields are just enough for their livelihood or subsistence. Ordil Lovi Commission on Elections, 192 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 100, 1992. What are the facts of the case? Congress enacted Republic Act 6766, 
an organic act for the Cordillera Autonomous Region to be composed of the provinces of Benguet, Mountain Province, Ifugao, Abra, Kalingrape Iao and the city of Baguio. But it was overwhelmingly rejected by the people in a plebiscite called for the purpose, except for the province of Ifugao. Thus, Kamalek resolved that the car was approved only by the people in Ifugao province. Thus, Congress set the date of election. The keywords provinces, cities, municipalities and geographical areas connote that region means two or more provinces. It should be construed according to its common use and ordinary meaning. The 13 regions into which the country is divided for administrative purposes are groupings of contiguous provinces. What about the provisions in RA 6766, do they reveal what is contemplated by the term region? Yes, Section 2 contemplates development of provinces cities, municipalities whereas Section 4 contemplates regional assembly districts. What is your one-liner for this case? Words in the Constitution should be understood in their common use and ordinary meaning. Thus, the term region as ordinarily used in the 13 regions in the country refers to groupings of contiguous provinces. The keyword provinces, cities, municipalities and geographical areas connote that region means two or more provinces. Between words with restricted and general meanings, which prevail? The general meaning prevails. Except? If the context indicates that the limited sense is intended. What is the reason for this rule? The Constitution is an organic law that deals with broader subjects. What are the criticisms against the 1987 Constitution? That it is excessively long and verbose. It sounds like a political speech rather than a formal document stating only basic precepts. It includes topics that have no place in the Constitution like sports, love, drugs, and even advertising in rhythm and harmony of nature. But worse, it uses tortuous language like the following masterpiece of circumlocution. Article 16, Section 10. The state shall provide the policy environment for the full development of Filipino capability and the emergence of communication structures suitable to the needs and aspirations of the nation and the balanced flow of information into, out of, and across the country, in accordance with a policy that respects the freedom of speech and of the press. To this, Justice Isagani A. Cruz reacted, Excuse me? Intrinsic aid to constitutional construction language or words of the Constitution. Extrinsic aids to constitutional construction, enumerated. 1. History or realities existing at the time of the adoption of the Constitution. 2. Proceedings of the Constitutional Convention. 3. Changes in phraseology. 4. Prior laws and rejudicial decisions. 5. Construction of U.S. constitutional provisions. 6. Contemporaneous construction and writings. 7. Consequences of alternative construction. 8. Construction given by executive officers. Illustrative case, history or realities. In Reba Mudes, 145 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 116, 162, 1986. Article 18. Section 5 of the Constitution states that the six-year term of the incumbent President and Vice President elected in the February 7, 1986 election is, for purposes of synchronization of elections, hereby extended to noon of June 30, 1992. Who is the incumbent President then? In applying history or realities, the SC said it is a matter of public record and common public knowledge that the CONCOM refers to incumbent President Carazan C. Aquino and Vice President Salvador H. Laurel, and to no other persons. What do proceedings of the convention include? They include debates, interpellations and opinions. Can we resort to proceedings right away? No, resort to proceedings may only be if are their extrinsic aid fail. Monte v. Camelec, 242 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act, 1995. Facts 
the province of Leyte and the cities of Tacloban and Ormoc are composed of five legislative districts. So, what was the problem of the petitioner then? Monto, who is the representative of the first district have claimed that the transfer of municipalities resulted in an equitable distribution of inhabitants and voters and violates the equality of representation ordained in the constitution. He said that the first district has 178,000 voters whereas the second district has 156,000 voters or a difference of 22,000 voters. What did he want the come elect to do then? He wanted the come elect to transfer to Losa, which had 7,000 from the first to the second district. How did the come elect defend its resolution? Its adjustment of municipalities involved the least disruption of the territorial composition of each district. IT complied with the constitutional requirement that each legislative district shall comprise, as far as practicable, contiguous, compact and adjacent territory. Section 2 of the Ordinance appended to the Constitution authorizes it to make minor adjustments in redistricting. How did the Supreme Court resolve the issue? Why? The Cumulec is without jurisdiction to apportion legislative districts and the phrase minor adjustments refer to the instance where a municipality was omitted in the enumeration of those composing the legislative district. How did the SC construe minor adjustments? From the debates and interpellations of the Constitutional Commission. The question of who has authority to apportion legislative districts is clearly answered in the following deliberations. MS. Aquino. I have to object to the provision which will give mandate to the come elect to do the redistricting. Redistricting is vitally linked to the baneful practices of cutting up areas or spheres of influence, in other words, gerrymandering. This commission, being non-partisan, a non-political deliberative body is in the best possible situation under the circumstances to undertake that responsibility. Mr. Opel. We know that the reapportionment of provinces and cities for the purpose of redistricting is generally inherent in the constituent power or in the legislative power. Mr. Sarmiento. May I move that this commission do the reapportionment of legislative districts? How did the Constitutional Commission vote? The results show 30 votes in favor and none against. The motion is approved. But what is the extent of authority granted to come elect the phrase minor adjustments in Section 2 of the appended ordinance? The Constitutional Commission deliberation show that it is limited to those omitted. Mr. David. The authority conferred would be on minor corrections or amendments, meaning to say, for instance, that we may have forgotten an intervening municipality in the enumeration, which ought to be included in one district. That we shall consider a minor amendment. Mr. De Castro. Can it be possible that one municipality in a district be transferred to another district and call it a minor adjustment? Mr. David. That cannot be done, Mr. Presiding Officer. Minor, meaning, that there should be no change in the allocations per district. However, it may happen that we have forgotten a municipality in between which is still in the territory of one assigned district or there may be an error in the correct name of a particular municipality. Mr. De Castro. So the minor adjustment which the Cumulec cannot do is that, if, for example, my municipality is in the first district of Laguna, they cannot put that in any other district. Mr. David. That is not even a minor correction. It is a substantive one. What is the value of changes in phraseology as an extrinsic aid? It may be inquired into to ascertain the intent of the provision as finally approved. Is mere deletion of a word or phrase conclusive? No, as it may have been omitted to avoid superfluity. Example. No person shall be compelled in a criminal case to be a witness against himself was changed to no person shall be compelled to be a witness against himself. What is the intent why the phrase in a criminal case was omitted? The intent is to make it available in cases other than criminal. Why are prior laws and rejudicial decisions considered extrinsic aids? The Constitution is written in reference to existing statutory laws at the time. 
Why is the construction by the U.S. Supreme Court of the U.S. constitutional provisions available as extrinsic aids? Most provisions on police power, eminent domain, taxation and Bill of Rights were taken or patterned after the U.S. Constitution. When do we apply contemporaneous construction? When there is substantial doubt and ambiguity. What is the value of the writings of constitutional convention delegates as extrinsic aid? They have persuasive effect. What happens when a constitutional provision is susceptible of more than one interpretation? That construction which leads to absurd, impossible or mischievous circumstances must be rejected. Marcelina V. Cruz, General Registration No. 42428, March 18, 1983. 121 Servicey Members Civil Relief Act 51. What happened in this case? Petitioner was charged with the crime of rape. On August 4, 1975, he rested his case. On September 4, 1975, he submitted his memorandum. On November 28, 1975, the judge submitted with the deputy clerk of court his decision for promulgation. Notices of promulgation were sent to all parties involved. What was the ground for resting? The trial court lost jurisdiction over the case for failure to decide the case within 90 days from date of submission for resolution. The three-month period prescribed by Section 11, 1, of Article 10 of the 1973 Constitution, being a constitutional directive, is mandatory in character. Section 11 1 of Article X says, Upon the effectivity of this Constitution, the maximum period within which a case or matter shall be decided or resolved from the date of its submission, shall be 18 months for the Supreme Court, and, unless reduced by the Supreme Court, 12 months for all inferior collegiate courts, and 3 months for all other inferior courts. Article 8, Section 15, 1, of the 1987 Constitution says, all cases or matters filed after the effectivity of this Constitution must be decided or resolved within 24 months from the date of submission for the Supreme Court, and unless reduced by the Supreme Court, 12 months for all lower collegiate courts and 3 months for all other lower courts. How did the Supreme Court resolve the issue of timeliness? The case was submitted for decision on September 4, 1975 and the judge rendered his decision on November 28, 1975 hence only 85 days have lapsed. How did the Supreme Court construe the constitutional provision prescribing time to decide? It was construed as merely directory. Why? To make it mandatory would make judges lose jurisdiction over the cases if they fail to decide on time which consequence will cause greater injury to the public. Does it follow that litigants are powerless if the judge delays to resolve cases? Not necessarily, the judge may be administratively liable. What is your one-liner for this case? Constitutional provisions are to be construed as mandatory, unless by express provision or by necessary implication, a different intention is manifest, or if they relate merely to matter of procedure. Bo v. Kumalek, General Registration No. 221697, March 8, 2016. How do we know that a provision relates to matter of procedure? When the time prescribed to decide a case was incorporated for reasons of expediency, it is deemed merely procedural. Why is construction made by executive officers given weight? Because they are the first to interpret the law. Is there a condition before it is given weight? Yes, provided that it has been construed for a considerable period of time. Mandatory or directory character of constitutional provisions? Are constitutional provisions mandatory or directory? Generally, they are mandatory in nature. What are the exceptions? If expressly provided. By necessary implication. A different intention is manifested. Why are they generally mandatory? It is the sovereign itself that speaks, laying down rules which for the time being control both the government and the governed. 
to hold that any of the constitutional provisions is to be obeyed or disregarded at the will or pleasure of the legislature is a dangerous doctrine. It lowers the dignity befitting the fundamental law of the land. Preamble and Titles, How Construed how are preamble and title construed? They may furnish evidence of the meaning and intention of the Constitution, but they are given little weight. Constitutional prohibitions, how construed? How are constitutional provisions construed? They are construed positively and unequivocally. Constitutional grant of power, how construed? How is constitutional grant of power construed? It is construed as a mandate, and not a mere direction. What does such grant of power include? IT includes all such particular and auxiliary powers necessary to make it effectual. But what if the means for the exercise of a grant of power are specified in the Constitution? All other means are deemed excluded. Prospective or retroactive application. How are constitutional provisions applied? prospectively or retroactively, prospectively, unless otherwise intended. Self-executing provision, defined. Jing owner versus Carrick. General Registration No. 94571, April 22, 1991. Pimatong v. Kumalek, General Registration No. 161872, April 13, 2004. How do you define self-executing provision? It is one which is complete by itself and becomes operative without the aid of supplementary or enabling legislation or which supplies sufficient rule by means of which the right it grants may be enjoyed or protected. Are constitutional provisions self-executing? Generally, they are, except when the provision expressly requires enabling law to implement it or from the language or tenure, they are mere declarations of policies and principles. What if there is a doubt whether a provision is self-executing or not? It should be resolved in favor of it being self-executing. Section 5, 5, Article 4 of the Constitution says, The state shall assign the highest budgetary priority to education and ensure that teaching will attract and retain its rightful share of the best available talents through adequate remuneration and other means of job satisfaction and fulfillment. Is this mandatory and self-executing? No, the provision does not mean that the hands of Congress are so hamstrung as to deprive it of the power to respond to the imperatives of the national interest and for the attainment of other state policies or objectives. 